So I will call to order the Common Council meeting of Tuesday, January 4th, 2022. And I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Alder Halverson. Present. Alder Harrington McKinney. Present. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Limmer. Here. Vice President Martin. Here. Alder Mayanzi will be arriving later. Alder Revere. I do not see Otter Vivir yet. Otter Vitavir. Present. Otter Wahelier. Here. President Abbas. Present. Otter Alboras. Otter Alboras. Uh, we'll come back. Alder Benford. Alder Bennett. Here. Alder Carter. Present. Alder Conklin. Present. Alder Curry. Here. Alder Evers. Here. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Furman. Present. Alder Revere. Here. Alder Alboras. Here. And Madam Mayor, we have quorum. Thank you. I have a few opening remarks uh, to begin with, uh, but let's first have the meeting instructions, please. Thank you. Welcome to our virtual meeting. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. Members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. All panelists have the ability to mute and unmute themselves. Please continue to use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions, or request a roll call vote. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public have registered to speak. The name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. City staff will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the council may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the council, please send it to the email listed on today's agenda. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me start by wishing you all a happy new year um, and to share wishes that 2022 will be a healthier and easier year for all of us and for our community. Um, I also want to give you my regular reminder that we're all here to do uh, the business of our constituents, the residents of Madison, and um, to try and keep that in mind and to refrain from uh, using any profanity, whether you're a, a staff person, a council member, or an attendee, um, and to try and um, interact respectfully in this space. And then I want to um, let those of you know who, who might not know already um, that our former park superintendent, Dan Stepe, passed away last month. Um, and some of you, perhaps Alder Revere, uh, remembers him. Um, Others might not, um, but Dan was our park superintendent for 25 years. Um, he was involved in the construction of Ulbrich Botanical Gardens, Elver Park, the Warner Park Community Center, the Wingra Boathouse, the Warner Park Shelter, and many other neighborhood park shelters and improvements. Um, he oversaw our golf courses, our ice arenas, the cross-country trails, the athletic fields, uh, including Bree Stevens, 
And of course, as park superintendent was responsible for acres and acres of our parkland, beaches, boats, ramps, and Forest Hill Cemetery. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to remember Dan um, and his legacy and dedication to our park system and um, to recognize his service and to share with his family um, our condolences on his loss um, and to thank him and again and his family for his many, many years of service to the city and to our parks department. With that, um, President Abbas, suspension of the rules, please. Thank you. Move motion to suspend rules 2.04, order of businesses, 2.05, introduction of businesses, 2.24, ordinances, and 2.25, resolution for items so designated, designated on the agenda. Second. It's moved and seconded to suspend the rules. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, those rules are suspended and we'll move to our agenda. Um, President Abbas, on item one, may I have a motion, please? Yes, uh, move motion to adopt. Second. It's moved and seconded to adopt. It's my honor to read this resolution, which is Legistar 68920, honoring the University of Wisconsin women's volleyball team on winning the NCAA national championship. And I have to bring up my prop for this particular resolution. Whereas the UW women's volleyball team won the Division I NCAA National Championship for the first time in program history. And whereas founded in 1974, the team previously played in three NCAA National Championship finals in 2000, 2013, and 2019, losing in those finals to Nebraska, Penn State, and Stanford respectively. And whereas this team included super seniors, Dana Retke, Sydney Hilly, Grace Loberg, Lauren Barnes, Georgia Civita, returning for a fifth year of eligibility because of COVID-19, maybe the only thing, good thing we got from COVID-19, for a chance to battle for the NCAA National Championship. And whereas they were joined by Jade Demps, Anna Smrek, Julia Orzal, Devin Robinson and Izzy Ashburn in making that dream come true when they knocked off unbeaten Louisville in five sets in the semifinals on Thursday, December 16th, 2021, an amazing game, and returned on Saturday, December 18th, 2021, to beat Nebraska in five sets, which ran three hours and 14 minutes, another amazing game. And whereas individual team members earned amazing honors such as Dana Retke, the 2021 National Player of the Year and the program's first five-time first-team All-American and Sydney Hilly honored as a two-time first-team All-American and Anna Smrek named the tournament Most Outstanding Player. And whereas the team was led by head coach Kelly Sheffield and assistant coaches Brittany Deldine and Gary White and additional team support staff athletic trainer Kristen Walker, and strength and conditioning coach Kevin Schultz. And whereas Coach Sheffield acknowledged that his this team stands on the shoulders of the alums that have come before them. And whereas the team has embraced their fans, the thousands who traveled to Columbus, Ohio to cheer them on, including eight-year-old Izzy Eaton, a young girl adopted by the team after they helped celebrate her sixth birthday, and whereas the team has some of the strongest support in college volleyball with screens at Union South, restaurants, local taverns, and thousands of living rooms, including mine, around the state, tuned into the games, bringing Wisconsinites together to celebrate a deserving team. And whereas thousands turned out for a welcome home celebration at the UW Fieldhouse after a parade of fire trucks led the team to the event. And whereas the entire Madison community joins together in showing their admiration, appreciation, and even adoration for this team of strong women who have overcome adversities over the years of their college careers to emerge as national champions. And now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Satya Rhodes-Conway, and the Common Council are included in their thousands of fans in congratulating this team on their amazing accomplishment. 
And with us here tonight is the incredible Coach Sheffield to receive this uh, proclamation. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. And please feel free to say a few words. Oh, <laughs> Th thank you for that. Uh, a heck of a uh, of an honor and introduction. And uh, it, I mean, this is this is, the community support is just is unbelievable. I mean, it just it's been nonstop. It's just it's another special place. Uh, reason about uh, this city and this state, and you know, we feel the love, we feel the support, and and we're really appreciative of of uh, th this honor here tonight. Thank you, Coach. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize your incredible work and your amazing team. Um, uh, congratulations. Uh, given my early remarks, I am not including some stronger language when I say national mm, champions. <laughs> congratulations <laughs> to you and your whole team. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you can see you're getting a, a virtual round of applause from the council. I, 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 I see it. I see it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, then before we vote, uh, Vice President Martin. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you, Coach, for being here with us. Um, I fancy myself a, a, a recreational athlete and love watching sports of all kinds. And I have to say that watching this team this season has been amazing. Um, it, the competition has been insane that the, the last game had had us all uh, on the edge of our seats. And I have to say that the only other time I've ever seen an entire, like I, I was watching at a neighborhood tavern and this is the first time besides the U S women's world cup um, uh, two summers ago that I have seen a, a packed venue, a, a packed location cheering their heads off for women's sports here in Wisconsin. Um, so I thank you for everything that you do. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the incredible season that you put on. And, and um, I, I'm just, I'm just really grateful for all of the efforts, even though that I'm not hundred percent sure that I know what a libero does. I'm trying to learn. So thank you guys so much. And please pass um, our respects on to your team. Thank you. I will thank you. My my libero actually tells me quite often that she doesn't think I know what a libero is. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Vice President Martin. And with that, is there any objection to recording an enthusiastic vote in favor of item one? Seeing no objection, we'll record that vote. Thank you again, Coach, for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and then we'll move on to item two, um, and I, I think we'll take this as moved by Alder Revere and, and seconded by President Abbas, um, and I'll turn it over to Alder Revere. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with a heavy heart, it is my honor to read a resolution recognizing, honoring, and commemorating the exemplary life and public service of R. Richard Dick Wagner. Whereas Roland Richard Dick Wagner was born in Dayton, Ohio on September 29, 1943, and passed away on December 13, 2021, at the age of 78 in Madison, Wisconsin. And whereas Dick moved to Wisconsin in 1965 to pursue and earn master's and doctorate degrees in American history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and subsequently decided to make Madison his home. And whereas Dick was employed in state of Wisconsin civil service for 33 years, including joining the Wisconsin Department of Administration as a budget and policy analyst from 1979 until his retirement in 2005. And whereas Dick chaired the Madison Landmarks Commission and headed up the historic park fund, which created the period garden park in Mansion Hill. He lived in several Madison landmark homes and was a founding member of Historic Madison Inc and the Madison Trust for Historic Preservation. And whereas Dick was appointed by Madison mayors, Paul Sodlin, Joel Skornica, Joe Sensenbrenner, Sue Bauman, and Dave Chislevich to numerous city boards, committees, and commissions. His service included chairing several city bodies, 
including the Plan Commission and the Urban Design Commission. And whereas in 1980, Dick was elected to the Dane County Board of Supervisors, where he served 14 years, including four years as chairperson. County service included the Dane County Regional Planning Commission, where he championed the first dark weather water quality plan and on the airport commission, where he championed noise abatement efforts. He was instrumental in securing Dane County's participation in the construction of Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center. And whereas Dick was the first openly gay member of the Dane County Board of Supervisors, including four years as the first openly gay county board chair in Wisconsin, paving the way for generations of LGBTQ politicians, activists, and public figures in Wisconsin. And whereas as one of the first dozen openly LGBTQ officials in the nation, in 1985, Dick was a founding member of the National Association and Conference of Gay and Lesbian Public Official Officials, now the Victory Institute, and co-hosted with now Senator Tammy Baldwin, the fifth conference in Madison. And whereas Dick was instrumental in enacting the city of Madison's gay rights ordinance in 1974 and Dane County's non-discrimination ordinance in 1980, which paved the way for Wisconsin statewide non-discrimination law in 1982. Whereas Dick's commitment to leadership extended far beyond his own political career through mentorship, advocacy, and in a variety of important positions under several different governor's administrations. Governor Martin Schreiber appointed him to the Wisconsin Arts Board, where he served as chairperson, and the Wisconsin Humanities Council. Governor Tony Earle appointed him as co-chair of the historic Governor's Council on Lesbian and Gay Issues. And whereas Dick served on countless state and local community organization boards, including Oldbrook Botanical Society for three decades, AIDS Network, Downtown Madison, Inc., Fair Wisconsin, and Friends of UW Libraries. Whereas Dick was one of the co-founders of UW Madison's LGBTQ Alumni Association and was a founding member and first co-chair of the New Harvest Foundation for LGBTQ charitable causes in the region. Whereas Dick authored two groundbreaking books, which together are widely understood to be the definitive history of Wisconsin's LGBTQ community. 2019's We've Been Here All Along, Wisconsin's Early Gay History, which documented Wisconsin's gay history from 1895 through the 1969 Stonewall Riots, and 2020's Coming Out, Moving Forward, Wisconsin's Recent Gay History. And whereas Dick was recognized for his public service as the first recipient of Madison's Jeffrey Clay Erlanger Civility and Public Discourse Award in 2007, on the occasion of the publication of his first volume, Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway, declared June 25, 2019, as our Richard Wagner Day in the city of Madison. And whereas Dick will be remembered as a gentleman and a scholar, public servant, activist, leader, and trailblazer in Wisconsin's LGBTQ community, valued mentor and friend, chef, gardener, and gracious host, and as a kind, generous, and compassionate person, who always treated others with dignity and respect. And whereas Dick's life and influence will continue to be an inspiration through his books, his work, his courage, and the work of those whom he mentored. Now therefore be it resolved that the mayor and common council recognize, honor, and commemorate the exemplary life and public service of our Richard Dick Wagner. Thank you, Alder Verveer. It's a tremendous loss to our community and and Dick will be missed by many of us, including me very deeply. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Oh, Alder Verveer. Thank you, Mayor. If I could just say a, another word or two. Um, Dick's life was one of public service um, from nonprofit to city, to county, to state service. He had an outsized influence on our community and its future, particularly because it was so often in an unelected role. Um, Dick's honoring resolution could have read even more like a resolution marking the departure of a longtime member of this body. That is with the long enumeration of each of the city's boards, committees, and commissions 
where Dick served over numerous decades with distinction, most often serving as chair, covering a wide range of issues facing our community. Uh, Dick's trailblazing work on behalf of the LGBTQ community is legendary. Among Dick's greatest legacies is his groundbreaking chronicles of Wisconsin's LGBTQ community. Uh, in fact, PBS Wisconsin is producing a documentary based on his two volume work. Not as well known as Dick's love and stewardship of Madison's parks, especially Ulbrich Botanical Gardens. He was instrumental in the creation of Period Garden Park in Mansion Hill, likewise Kermagee Park in the Marquette neighborhood. Dick unbelievably died, as many of you know, in the park near his home that he helped to create and gardens he tended there for years. I hope that the Board of Park Commissioners will rename Kermagee Park in memory of a true champion of our parks. I want to announce that the funeral service scheduled to take place at Holy Wisdom Monastery this Saturday has been postponed. Uh, we made the difficult decision that it needs to be rescheduled later when it is safer to gather and celebrate uh, Dick's incredible legacy to our community. So Dick was a be beloved by so many in our community. I don't know of anyone that didn't like him. On a personal note, I lost a very close friend and mentor of 30 years. I, like countless others, will miss him dearly. I want to thank you all for honoring a life very well lived. Thank you, Alder Vivere. And please make sure that um, we get the word on when his memorial is rescheduled so that we can continue to honor him. Alder Carter? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was just going to ask for that information to be sent to us. I served on the Urban Design um, Committee with Dick. Um, he was a great mentor and taught me a lot, and I definitely want to be at his memorial. Thank you. Thank you, Elder. All right, is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, we'll record that vote. That brings us to, with a deep breath, uh, to petitions and communications. Item number three, uh, President Abbas, a motion to accept the petition? Move motion to accept the petition. Second. Moved and seconded to accept the petition in item three, which is Legistar 68429. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that item is accepted. Uh, we have, let me refresh. Uh, do not believe we have any early public comment. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. President Abbas. Thank you. At this time, a consent agenda will be moved with the recommended action listing for each item except number one, items which have registrants wishing to speak, number two, items which require extraordinary roll call vote and are not included on the consent agenda by unanimous consent, number three, items which all groups have separated out for discussion and debate purposes. Uh, item... Agenda item five to 12 are public hearing items. Item requested for exclusion is agenda item number 47, legislative file number 68084, adopting the South Madison plan as a supplement to the comprehensive plan and directing staff to implement the recommendation contained in the plan. And then item introduced from the floor for referral, legislative file number 69107 by title only authorizing an amendment to a non-competitive contract with Aligned Energy Center for testing and vaccination services. Recommended action is referred to Finance Committee on January 10th, 2022. Right. Um just will note um, that there are registrants um, on items that not wishing to speak on items 59, five in support, and then 61 and 62 on each of those, one in support and one in opposition. 
Again, none of them wishing to speak. Are there additional exclusions, uh, introductions, disclosures, recusals? Alder Furman. Hi, Mayor. I'd like to exclude item number 62. Uh, number 62 will be excluded. Uh, Alder Wahilahi. Alder, uh, item 61. Also, item 61 will be excluded. Alder Vitiver. Uh, I need to recuse on item 28, Legistar 68654. My spouse is an employee of USGS. Just make sure the clerk has that. All right, you'll be noted as recusing on that. Are there any other separations, exclusions, introductions, disclosures, recusals? All right, so we'll just go over that one more time then. Um, five through 12 is public hearing. On the exclusion list, we have 47, 61, and 62. Uh, and we have an item uh, introduced from the floor with referral. Is there anything additional? Alder Hang to McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Could you uh, tell me um, if item, the status of item 68427, the resolution? Uh, is there an agenda number, Alder? Um, it's probably easier for you, for me not to find it. Is it 62? It's too cool. Yes, was that excluded? Yes, that was excluded. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wahila, hey, did you have something else? Yeah, for item number 74, will that be something that will be discussed after 62 item? Or is that just a... Uh, Alder, oh, item 74 is a placeholder that's introduced tonight okay. in uh, pending the outcome of the discussion. Okay. Um, okay. If it's relevant, it will move forward. If it's not, it can get placed on file in the future. Uh, if, and maybe, maybe this is not the time, but I, if an outcome comes out for referendum, will it be possible to make another uh, substitute or alternate. Uh, uh, yes, Alder. If it's if the desire, if the will of the body is to move forward, it it's just being introduced, so it will go. Um, it will be referred to the the work group and then back to the council. So there'll be ample time to discuss and um, my my have my, a substitute if you want. Yeah, my 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 recommendation is to refer. If we reached at that point to the CCC also. Um, I think uh, you when we you, when we are, when we reach there, then maybe help guide me to to make the the substitute instead of just referring to the TIFA committee. I would like to refer also to the CCC. I, I think actually, although that this is the appropriate time to, to do that because it will go on the consent agenda. And okay. so just in in keeping, and I'll give you a minute to do this while Alder Carter is uh, next, uh, in keeping with the requirements that the council has adopted for itself, um, if you could identify the date um, of the, the next CCEC that it would go to and then also the reason for the referral. Okay. Um, and then I'll I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter? Yes, I was just going to ask if, after public comment, if we could go to item 62 regarding the referendum only because we ran out of time last time for that. And I believe we need to, if I remember correctly, which don't go by my memory, that's why I depend on you, Mayor, that there's a deadline for it to get on the ballot or something that has to be done this month. Am I right on that? That's correct, Alder. I'll, I'll take that under advisement. And, and when we yep. make it through the consent agenda, we'll, we'll see if we can get agreement to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Carter. Alder Foster. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and perhaps Attorney House could just mm -hmm. confirm this, but I believe what the new procedure, the um, request for an additional referral should just pull it off of the consent agenda, and then we will deal with it 
in its regular order, which in this case might actually help since we'll have had the, the discussion. So we'll probably have a sense anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alder. Uh, you're probably right. I'm still getting used to your new process around referrals. Yes, the attorney confirms that that's the correct thing to do. So that's what we'll do. Alder Wahilahi, uh, we'll just put it on the um, exclusion list and, and come to it in due time. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Seeing none, then uh, President Abbas on the consent agenda. Move motion to adopt the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt the consent agenda. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that is recorded and uh, we will move to our public hearings, uh, which starts with item five, Legistar 68456. Uh, I will open a public hearing on a new license for Village Bar. Uh, on item five, we have three registrants, Matthew Fink of Verona, in support, Thomas Oberwater of Middleton in support, uh, excuse me, two registrants, um, uh, both in support and available to answer questions. Are there questions for either of our registrants? Seeing none, I will close that public hearing. President Abbas? Move motion to grant. Second. Moved and seconded to grant. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of granting? Seeing no objection, that item is granted. Item six is Legistar 68457. I'll open a public hearing on a new license for Starkweather Brewing Company. On item six, we have no registrants. I will close that public hearing, President Abbas. Move motion to place on file without prejudice. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of placing on file without prejudice? Seeing no objection, that item is placed on file. Item seven is Legistar 68458. I'll open a public hearing on a new license for Chiba Hut. On item seven, we have one registrant, Heather Gaulita of Milwaukee, in support, available to answer questions representing Chiba Hut. Are there any questions for our registrant? Seeing none, I will close that public hearing, President Abbas. Move motion to grant with conditions. Second. Moved and seconded to grant with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that item is granted. Takes us to the report of the Board of Public Works and item eight, which is Legistar 68734. I'll open a public hearing on approving plan specifications and a schedule of assessments for St. Paul Avenue, Ohio Avenue, Talmadge Street, Jackson Street, and La Follette Avenue Restruction, uh, Reconstruction Assessment District of 2022. On item eight, we have no registrants. Uh, I will close that public hearing, President Abbas. Move motion to adopt. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing none, that item is adopted. Takes us to the report of the plan commission and item nine, Legistar 68213. I'll open a public hearing on amending table 28H1 to correct inconsistencies. Uh, we have no registrants on item nine. I uh, will close that public hearing, President Abbas. Move motion to adopt. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that item is adopted. Item 10 is Legistar 68639. I'll open a public hearing on creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property at um, 1017 North Sherman Avenue. On item 10, we have no registrants. I will recess that public hearing. President DeVos. Motion to re refer it to January 24th plan commission meeting. Second. Moved and seconded to re refer. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? 
Seeing none, that item is re-referred. Item 11 is Legistar 68642. We'll open a public hearing on creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to amend a planned development district at 5818 Gemini Drive, uh, amending both the general development plan and approving a specific implementation plan. I have no registrants on item 11. I will close that public hearing. President Abbas. Move motion to adopt with conditions. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that item is adopted. Item 12 is Legistar 68644. I'll open a public hearing on creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to amend a planned development district at 5817 Halley Way, amending both the general development plan and creating uh, and approving a specific implementation plan. On item 12, we have no registrants. I will close that public hearing, President Abbas. Move motion to adopt with conditions. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt with conditions. Is there any objection to recording unanimous vote in favor? Seeing no objection, that item is adopted with conditions. And that brings us to the end of our public hearings. Uh, I'll remind us that we have items 47, 61, 62, and 74 uh, excluded. We've had a request to take item 62 up first. Is there any objection to taking up item 62? Seeing no objection, we will take up item 62. Give me a second. Um, which is Legistar 68427. Um, and I will turn, uh, so I'll first note that we have um, two registrants on this item, uh, Justice Castaneda from District 15 in support, available to answer questions, and Janet Hirsch from District 9 in opposition, not wishing to speak. Uh, are there questions for either of our registrants? Seeing none, then we'll move to a presentation from Attorney Haas. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, I can hopefully run through this uh, briefly. I do have a PowerPoint, if I could share my screen. Okay, one second. Is the PowerPoint appearing? Great, thank you. Okay, so I wanna thank Alder Furman for putting the PowerPoint together. This is based on previous information that the, uh, was presented to the council prior to last April's referendum elections um, uh, with, with some updates based on the results of that uh, election and the work of the TFOGS implement, imp, implementation work group. Um, uh, you're probably familiar with this history, but just a brief reca recap. The, uh, the Task Force on Government Structure was created by the Council to look into the, the, the structure of Madison City Government um, and to basically ask the question whether that structure ens ensures that decision makers are representative of and accountable to all residents of the city or only those with the time, resources, and knowledge of the process, the the uh, task force met uh, uh, extensively over two years, consisted of six resident members, five council members, and had numerous uh, open houses. Um, here are some of the key findings of the task force. Uh, found that the city's current structure uh, can be an impediment to full participation and representation 
uh, and is unfair to a large portion of the city's population, including residents of color and low income. Also that the city's pr process and procedures can be an obstacle to resident engagement, um, citing nighttime meetings downtown, um, the complexity sometimes of Robert's rules and the city uh, lacking adopting some, um, some avenues for resident engagement, uh, which the council ha has discussed in various forums, including remote participation, opportunity for public comment and testimony, um, and accessible, accessible uh, resources. Um, the task force noted that Madison is an outlier among comparable cities in a few key areas, uh, namely the number of boards, commissions, and committees being uh, double or more than most comparable, than other comparable cities, uh, the number of alders significantly more representing uh, smaller districts, um, and the city lagging behind in technology and resources to support resident engagement. Um, other findings uh, focused on the fact that the difference between representation or the opportunity for representation between alders who could work full time on city business and those who did not or could not, um, and that's sometimes being tied to, to the economics and uh, ultimately concluding that the current structure led to residents having disparate levels of representation, based at least partly on how much time their alder is able to devote to city work. One key uh, recommendation was a transition to a full-time council. Um, also, there were recommendations to reduce the number of districts from 20 to 10 and increase the length of all their terms from two years to four years. Um, these were key recommendations of a subcommittee of the task force. The task force recommended uh, four-year terms for alders, even if other changes were not adopted. Um, these were arguments that the, the final report of the task force um, presented regarding uh, a full-time council uh, focusing on providing equal representation, um, again, so that it was not dependent upon the time that an alder had available to do the job, uh, encouraging residents um, uh, who do not have the time or money uh, available to run for and serve on the council, um, a recognition that the job of an alder is a full-time job and should be compensated uh, as a full-time job. Uh, also providing alders with the time and resources to, to serve their constituents um, and to develop and oversee major uh, policy initiatives. Um, there, there was a, um, uh, the council then took that report and as you as you know, approved a non-binding referendum, including four questions um, to be on the spring election ballot last April. Um, <clears throat> this is just the language from the, the resolution directing the staff to, uh, to place the referendum questions on the ballot. And then to have the task force implementation work group um, evaluate the results of the advisor referendum elections and take uh, necessary steps to place a binding referendum question on the ballot uh, in the spring of 2022. So that is why this is back before the council. The uh, implementation work group um, considered this and decided to forward that, uh, really that task to the council to decide as a whole what the next steps would be. So here's some information about the four referendum questions. Um, the first one asked residents whether Madison should have a full-time council with a suggested uh, pay range. And uh, that was um, defeated 58% to 42%. 
the second question asks whether the size of the council should be uh, changed. I guess I refer to this as the the Goldilocks pie chart, I guess, uh, the majority of residents uh, voting to keep the size of the council the same. Um, the referendum question asking whether alders should uh, have four-year terms <clears throat> was uh, defeated uh, 55 to 45%. And finally, the question about uh, term limits was uh, supported uh, 71 percent to 29 percent. Uh, notably, the question asked if the council transitions to a full-time council, should alders uh, be subject to a 12-year term limit? Um, I, I'm not here to like in, interpret or analyze uh, those referendum election results. Um, you are all the elected officials and, and can uh, uh, to decide what those results mean. Going back to the TFOG's uh, final report, these are uh, the key recommendations. Again, uh, transitioning to a full-time council, reducing the size of the council to 10 members, increasing council member pay, increasing terms to four years, imposing 12-year term limits, uh, increased council leadership positions to uh, two-year terms if, the council terms are increased to four years. Um, uh, again, this was a recommendation that it would take place at the election following redistricting and that any changes to the size of the council or the terms of a member of the members be made by a charter ordinance. Um, those, <clears throat> those two um, directives are, are currently in the ordinances by virtue of previous charter ordinances. So they can only be changed by uh, a charter ordinance, including a referendum. So for next steps, the council has, you know, any number of options at its disposal, but specifically, you know, the, the, the resolution directed the council uh, to determine what to do with these referendum results. So the council could authorize a binding referendum on any of these topics, including a binding referendum on the questions that were uh, uh, contained in the advisory referendum election last spring. That would involve, <clears throat> first of all, determining whether or not the council wishes to hold the referendum, and then specifically what questions would be on the ballot, what the language of those questions would be. Um, as I mentioned, the size of the council and the length of the terms, those, those are the items that, re, that do require uh, referendum approval. Um, there was, I think the, the TFOG's report anticipated possibly having a referendum in the spring of 2022. That is certainly an option for that to happen at the April election. The county clerk needs to have the language of the referendum 70 days prior to the April election. So that means by January 25th, which is why we have a placeholder on your agenda for a possible resolution to be considered on January 18th. Um, uh, another option is to have a, a additional referendum questions on the ballot uh, next spring. As you know, there are no city elections this spring. Um, on this spring ballot, uh, alders will be up for election in 2023, uh, as well as the term of the mayor. Um, under state statutes, um, these referendum questions can only be on a ballot for the April election, um, not on a November election ballot, which we will have this fall. Other options are um, for the council to determine um, if there are any other recommendations from the TFOG's final report regarding the structure of the council um, that, that the council wants to direct the implementation task force or any other group to pursue. Um, and then separate from those recommendations, if there are any additional directions to provide to the task force implementation work group um, pertaining to the structure of the common council. 
So that is the conclusion of this presentation. Um, unless there's any request to go back to look at slides, I can stop sharing my screen and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Attorney Haas. Uh, we'll do questions then for Attorney Haas, starting with Alder Conklin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, hi, Attorney Mike Haas. Hello. Um, my question is, so if I'm understanding this correctly, all the referendum questions that were asked on the ballot were non-binding. So if we wanted to go back and make them bind it, do we have to put them on the ballot again for the vote for them to be official? Is that, is that kind of what I'm understanding? For the results to be binding, yes. I mean, you can consider the you know advisory referendum questions. I, I kind of glossed over this, but advisory referendum questions are basically like a survey or a straw poll that you're taking the temperature um, of of the residents without any binding results. Okay, so but from those results, we couldn't stick to anything from those results unless we put them back on the ballot again. So for 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 the two items that require referendum approval, the size of the council and the length of the term, the term those things can only be changed if the voters approve them. Okay. The other items, you could take the results of the advisor referendum and, and interpret them however you want, and you can pass ordinances or resolutions to adopt changes, even if they contradict what the voters decided. So again, you're just, you're okay. just taking the temperature of the voters, but the mm -hmm. council is not bound by those. So it is, it is a good point that the council could act on some of those, many of those matters uh, without going back to a referendum election uh, if it chose chose to do so. But the size and the full time, that that is off limits. We have to put that back onto the ballot. If the council wants to proceed with either changing the size of the council or the length of the term, not the full time. That okay, can be okay. done, length of that the can term. Be done okay. by council action. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think that's all my questions. Sure. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wahili. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Attorney Has, could you please go back to the slide for the council size? Oh, sure. So. So 17% chose, this was a multiple choice question, 17% uh, voted to reduce the size, 13% to increase, and 70% to keep the size the same. Okay, thank you. So my other question is, as you know, you explained earlier, uh, when we have the, uh, the, um, the advisory referendum, uh, the only item that are we are obligated to put back as a referendum is the size and the length. Uh, is that correct? If the council wishes to to have another referendum, or if the council wishes to take any action on those two items, then it needs to go back to a referendum. And the other question is, since the will of the power of the residency has spoken and they have laid out their preference, we could just do nothing about this, right? We don't have to put any referendum for that matter and we would be okay, correct? Correct, that is certainly an option. Okay, and my final question is, uh, since we are pushing to put this uh, binary referendum in uh, this uh, April election, which is only school board, and county, is that, do we need to put the referendum when there's municipal election or it could go to any election? Uh, it, it, would need, it, it would need to be on a ballot for an April election, mm -hmm. which could be this year or next year or a future year. It cannot go on the ballot for a February election or an August or November election. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
Thank you, Alder. Alder Lemmer. Thank you. Um, I have a question about, um, I guess, the benefits to having this on the ballot in April 2022 versus April 2023. It seems like you know there may be some um, natural benefits to having it in 2023 would give us time to have a you know, communications and engagement plan so that folks have a, a deeper understanding of what they are going to be voting on and deciding. Um, uh, that may be a higher turnout election next year and you know, maybe we'll be in a more normal time even. Who knows? So, well, there, is there a question? Yes, I'm just wondering if there are benefits to having this in 2022 instead of 2023. Well, I, I will answer that in two ways. One is this, this is not really, there aren't any legal, uh, you know, there's nothing, this is not real legal advice. I'll just give you this, my perspective having been involved in elections um, as an election official, you're, you're certainly correct. There are no city elections. You might surmise that people involved in city elections, um, you know, there will not be opportunities to vote on other city offices this spring. They might be more interested next year. Um, uh, as you mentioned, if the council is interested in doing any additional public information, uh, effort and resident engagement. There will be more time. You know, there are there may be other benefits to having this an election this year, if if the council believes that you know this is maybe still on the minds of folks, then it's better to have it closer to that election. So these are all really policy considerations, and I'm sure there are more that uh, that you and your colleagues can uh, consider when you get to discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Are there any other questions for Attorney Haas or any other staff? All right, then uh, on item 62, President Abbas, a motion? Uh, the motion will be adopt, right? I'm not it's sure. A, what the, it's a place to start. Yes, I'm not sure. What the motion uh, but I mean, is. I guess that's right. It's actually just a discussion. So uh, right. perhaps we don't need a motion, and and perhaps the discussion leads to a motion. Um, so we'll we'll just proceed with discussion then. Um, so on on the question uh, of the results of the advisory referendum and determining whether to move forward with a binding referendum. Um, Alder Furman. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to do my best to actually, um, believe it or not, try to keep uh, my opinion on this uh, to myself for, for uh, at least the beginning of this discussion because I do have some strong opinions. I just wanted to make a few very quick points. Um, you know, I, I heard from a task force member that made it clear to me, um, and, and you can see that in the resolution that we adopted, um, the count, this council did tell um, uh, the task force that we would have uh, a binding resolution, uh, a binding question on the ballot, um, regardless of the advisory. Um, and so, just just to keep in mind um, that 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 that's in that resolution. That doesn't mean we have to do that, um, but that is something that the task force was expecting. Um, not necessarily my position, um, and again, I'll, I'll share more of my opinion in a little, in a little bit, um, but uh, Attorney Haas left out, um, I think, a point on, on why there may be a benefit to putting this on 2022 or the goal um, of having this figured out um, uh, as soon as possible, which is um, the results could then affect what happens in 2023 election. So, for example, if we're going to change the size of the council, um, then the 2023 election, that, that size change would take effect then, or the longer term would take effect then, opposed to then having to wait till 2025 um, for, for that change. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, I think ideally the goal would have been to have something binding in 2021 and have given us a, a much longer time to redistrict, knowing what the size looked like, et cetera. Um, but I think there was a really big questions about what the language should look like, um, and and I think there were very there were concerns of TFOX members, and and then that was um, amplified by the council on um, did people want a, a bigger council, a smaller council, or, or stay the same? And we certainly got some um, opinion on that on the ballot. So um, some things to keep in mind. But I am very interested in what people's opinions are this evening. Obviously, you know, ballot question in 2022 or 2023 is is certainly an option. Um, I do think that the the report speaks. Loud 
loudly about um, issues with um, the council structure. And so if we're not going to do a ballot question or change the structure, what are some other things we can do? We talked about that in the implementation work group. I'm sure some members will share some of the things that we we talked about um, in the work group here of, of alternative ways to possibly deal with that. Um, and then, you know, we, we as a work group, obviously, if there are more things you want us to be looking into or working on, we're more than happy to take direction. Um, so I'm hopeful we have a good chat about that this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Furman. President Abbas. Thank you very much. I will also try to be brief, and I also have a strong opinion as well. Uh, with this uh, TFOX, I also want to mention during attorney has presentation, if we read report, a lot of those recommendations about four years, full-time, part-time, it was not unanimously approved. So there was concern within the TFOX uh, members about uh, keeping, uh, if we bring a full-time and uh, uh, with paying 80 percent Dane County income, I think so you can read there there's a lot of information on the report. There was many concern about making it more professional, like legislative body of state of Wisconsin, and et cetera, and et cetera. A couple of things I will I will say is uh, as a north, my aldermanic district and the north side of Madison, the majority of the residents they voted against. Uh, the ideas about the full-time idea about reducing to 10 and hearing their voices. And now me as an alder, if I go and say, hey, I heard your voice, but guess what? I'm going to do a binding referendum anyway. I know you guys voted down those ideas, but I'm not going to listen to you guys and I'm going to move forward with the full-time. I, I do think it looks really bad um, in public domain. And it looks like we are not listening our constituents and their voices. Uh, second concern I have is with 2022 is uh, moving forward in 2022. Uh, it's a school board election and county. A lot of cities are un seats are uncontested. Uh, going through through a pandemic, voter turnout. Uh, I'm not sure how the voter turnout is going to be. People are not really engaged with the uh, uh, city council elections are more where people are more engaged. And if you know, last time we had many seats were contested. And we have primaries in many seats and, and general election, and it's also going to be a mayoral election. So I think so. If this body decide, regardless, I'm not in a favor of putting binding referendum, but let's say for sake of argument, if majority decide they still want to bring that in front of the uh, citizens of Madison, then I would suggest do it in 2023, where politically everybody's engaged and you have a higher voter turnout, so everybody voice get heard rather than doing in 2022. And also in 2022, another concern I have, uh, if you look into really deep down, look into those numbers beside big percentage, 58, 42% in various questions, there's a various percentage. Ismis area have a higher amount of voter turnout. And also uh, Ismis basically voted 52%, 51%, if I'm not wrong, that area won full-time. Uh, full-time uh, <clears throat> common council. And I think so it was a 48 person very close in Monroe district. Uh, I'm again recalling my memory. I don't have data in front of me. And if we, these are the districts uh, are, are also former district Bidar, which is older, whatever district is really high voter turnout there too. So that, that was also close. If we're gonna put in 2022, these higher people who engage a lot and mostly those people are uh, privileged people rather than people of color. I do think so. It might really be harmful for us to put this in 2022. And I, I understand what Alder Furman is coming from, and I completely get that. But just for sake of uh, clarity about giving opportunity to broader community, it's very important to, uh, to think about it while we're making such an important decision for our common council. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett. I have to agree with Alder Abbas in that um, one, and also um, some of which Alder Lemmer stated in um, her question, um, during the election cycle, like right around the end of our election, um, I was receiving like tons of calls or when I was calling people with phone banking, 
of people asking what is what are these questions that I'm just now seeing on the ballot. Um, and people didn't even really know what they were voting for one way or the other. So I don't know even if the results that we just saw are completely accurate to what people may think if they had more time to fully comprehend um, what they were voting on in these advisory referendum questions. Um, and I'm not convinced that that outreach can be done um, between now and the April election. Furthermore, um, I have to admit that like as a young person as and as a um, student elder, as a student, I'm extremely against um, the um, the push to have four year terms and to go full time just as a full time student and knowing like how these operations work, um, it's going to be extremely difficult for any student or young person to run, be able to run for an election, let alone serve on council. Um, so, and even in that vein, this election. Um, is for a for not even for council is for school board um, and issues in which only a select um, number of people are actually going to be voting in that election um, and is not representative of those that um, want to um, that um, understand like council issues um, that we're facing. And um, so all that set, stated, I believe that um, I understand, I, I understand the push to go to um, 2022. It's like, um, and we're very excited about these changes and maybe they could happen in 2023. However, um, these are changes that are going to be long lasting. We don't need to be um, forcing this through, we can take our time with it, make sure that we have enough public outreach so that people really understand the issues that they're voting on and how they would like their council to look like. Thank you, Alder. Alder Conklin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> um, you know, I think I, I'm definitely voting for, or pushing for, I should say, that we try to get this on the ballot as soon as possible. Um, I think 2022 would be a great year to put this on the ballot because, for one, I think this goes to show you how important it is to look at a full-time council and how to look for at longer terms because as we've seen this come in, when we all came in, all the newbies came in in 2021. And if you're talking about pushing it out further until 2023, when our terms end, we may not be able to see the end result. And I think that that's where a lot of problems are going to come in at. With only a two-year term, if we don't run a four-year term, especially concurrent with the mayor, you know, like she has or he has the same people start with them to end with them, I think is very important. But not only that too, being a single mother, uh, raising my children, it's definitely important that we get paid accordingly because many people, like uh, Alder Bennett said, you know, many people were asking us during our election, what were our thoughts and what were our ideas about this and I really couldn't have any because I didn't sit on the you know I haven't sat at the table before but now that I've had my seat at the table in order for us to continue to represent Madison Wisconsin and have many different people who do not look alike sit amongst the same table we have to be paid accordingly and 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 be able to take care of our children and be able to you know, keep a roof over our head and have our basic needs met. You know, everyone wants their basic needs met, but if the people trying to represent them aren't having our own basic need met, it makes it very difficult. So, I mean, I, I'm really hoping that the rest of the council will see the benefits of having this on the ballot as soon as possible in April, this April. And, um, you know, I'm going to yield the rest of my time. So thank you. 
Thank you, Alder. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm looking at the four questions and the percentages for those questions. Yes, the way we um, all are. And, but I'm really looking at what's before us in 2022 if it goes on the ballot and what might be before us in 2023 if it goes on the ballot. Um, this council um, has voted to stay uh, virtual because of COVID and the reoccurring um, um, a new strain. And, um, and so what we're talking about, and I'm, on a, I'm a, a chief inspector, and when um, COVID first hit, um, I looked at individuals uh, coming into the center to vote. I mean, they were masked, the, the clerk made adjustments, um, but I'm not really sure of these two things. One, I'm not sure what the turnout will be, the comfort level in voting, and you can always say, well, they can vote absentee, but I'm not really sure about what that turnout. But more importantly, I'm not people are still trying to figure out redistricting. I mean, we're in the middle of that. But the other thing that really concerns me is what has been the engagement to have constituents, have voters better informed about what's before them. Um, there's been no, no concerted effort to really educate people. Some people, yes, they get it, they understand. But what is what has happened to make a more informed public from now to, which we're in January, um, and from January to, to April, what is it going to, what's going to happen to make a better informed um, voter so that they'll understand what the options were. And so um, that's what, that's really what my, my, my challenge is um, more so than um, having it binding or not binding. I think rushing through it. I mean, um, as the Alder said, this is, and I, I mean, it's not going to affect me at all, but this is a very serious consideration when we're talking about it and to make that serious consideration in a month and a half or whatever just doesn't seem to do justice. And so I'm really struggling with it. Thank you, I'm complete. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess I'll start by saying I agree with parts of what <laughs> most other Alders have had to say. Um, I, I'll say, uh, personally, I was greatly disappointed in the results of the advisory referendum, but not surprised. And um, I hope that we'll continue to work on all of these issues. I think they're really important. Um, I, 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 I'd be surprised if any alders were surprised at the results of that advisory referendum. I think we kind of saw it coming. Uh, although, as I said, I was very disappointed by it. Um, and I, I just wanted to remind everyone that if we put questions on the ballot in 2022 or 2023, they don't have to be these same questions. They could be, we, you know, do you agree that we should declare blue is green and orange is yellow? We can do whatever we want. They don't, we don't have to use the same language. We can go after different parts of, of TFOG's recommendations, even related to city council makeup. Uh, we can tweak the language in any way we want. But uh, the key, I think, is is what we just heard too, uh, what Alder Harrington McKinney had to say. You know, we there's just a ton of education to do before I think we can have a successful, and by successful, uh, I don't necessarily mean what I want, uh, a successful referendum where we have quite a few voters that are educated on what they're voting on. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just have two questions. Well, I have one question. I don't know if Attorney Haas is, is around, but um, if this, if if we put it on the ballot in April or 2023, um, when does it go into effect? 
And if he's around, he can answer that. My second um, comment. Well, although let's deal with that is, first. I, I believe. He, I believe the answer is that it, you would include an effective date. Okay. But uh, attorney Haas can I contradict me. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I think we... Oh, there he is. It, the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, okay. You, you would include an effective date in the language. Okay, great. My other concern is um, I think the, the um, desire to go full time and get a salary of close to what 67,000 a year is tempting however i think we need to look at the fact of and that's if we go full time and and i think it's 4 years but i think we have to also look at if you don't get reelected how quickly can you get another job here in Madison? It might not be an issue. It's not an issue for me, but it might be an issue for some. So as we sit up here and say, we'll have more diversity, we will have longer uh, terms, term limits to, I should say term, to get things done, we can better engage our district, we can do all these good things, we have to look at the entire picture. And and I think Alder Bennett uh, made some good points, and Alder McKinney and Alder Cochlin. I think we've all making good points, but I want to make sure that we see the broader picture because um, we might not be sitting here. It might be someone else. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Carter. Alder Benford. Thank you, Mayor. Hope you're doing well. Oh, gosh, there's so much running through my mind with this conversation. What a way to start off 2023 uh, here. So I'm, I'm a little... 22 still. Oh, don't, my gosh. See? Don't skip a year uh, on us, see, Alder. I, <laughs> I don't remember what I had for breakfast, Mayor, so I'm slipping. <laughs> So uh, I want to say I'm conflicted, Mayor, because I recognize that countless hours were devoted to this issue by the TFOX uh, committee. I thought I saw in Attorney Haas's presentation where over 90 meetings took place. So there was so much time and energy. But Mayor, what guides my thinking about this, I don't know what your screen is set up like, but as I look at all the faces. It looks like a postage stamp of beautiful, diverse folks from really vastly different backgrounds. So isn't this the most diverse council in Madison's history? I think it is. It was way more diverse when I uh, uh, now than when I served the last time. So if the intent is to bring diverse voices to the Common Council, you know what, Mayor, it appears to me that we don't need to attempt to artificially restructure this council. But, you know, with that said, I think that there's some TFOG recommendations, or if we look at the conclusions of the elections, that I can get behind. And I want to say to my colleague, uh, Mayor, if I may, Alder Conklin, I'm deeply sensitive and I can definitely relate. When I served last time, I was a single father of five or four at the time working low income jobs and having to work sometimes two full time jobs and serve as an alder. So when I look at the election results, uh, I guess the clearest thing, I'm not a pollster or anything like that, but uh, folks want term limits. They want term limits. So we could spin it and say they only wanted it if we went full time. Uh, but for me, I think there's value in term limits. Uh, I don't want to go through everything, uh, all the considerations, but I personally believe that uh, true leadership requires that each and every one of us cultivate and make room for other leaders. Um, they said that they want the council size to stay the same. I, I agree. I, I certainly agree. And I once again say all of this, recognizing that so much work was done by this committee. They said nope to four years. Um, 
I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that, you know, you serve one year, you try to do your due diligence to do the good work, and then boom, all of a sudden you're in election mode. Uh, how do you get reelected? I think four years would give continuity, but uh, some people would counter and say that if you're a really sucky alder, we're stuck with you for four years. So maybe two years isn't so bad. Now, once again, if we're talking about representation, uh, you know, if we're really, if I'm really being honest, I certainly understand that some folks might have more privilege or they might just have more time and how they serve their district. That's really up to the voters. Every election that becomes apparent and the people decide who they want. So. I think as we talk about, do we put something on the ballot this next spring? Uh, it's not soup yet. There's just so many considerations that we have to think about. And I think there's something about, uh, I'm, I'm still uh, once again, very sensitive to uh, how do we uh, support more diverse voices with lived experiences serving on this body. So I think if we had more time, maybe we could talk about middle ground. Maybe if someone was at uh, X amount of the poverty level, they were really struggling to keep a roof, to put food. We we want to maybe think of a way, a, a, a decent pay. So there could be other questions as we talked about in our conversations that could be on a future uh, ballot, on a future referendum. So. With that, I don't think there's any mad rush to do anything right away. Uh, if I, once again, and being totally honest, uh, in the past, I believed in term limits. And you can argue once again that that's what elections are all about. But it's just my personal opinion that as I think about restructuring the council, I think sometimes what's missing, and as I look at the screen and see all these faces, I think... We got it. I think we're we're diverse. There's ways that people are running. New BIPOC people are running, and I think that's very powerful. Uh, so I don't think we need to artificially do anything. And then when I one last thing, Mayor, if I may, when I think of a full time older person, and I think of what's going to happen during these elections. So if we really want diversity, if we really want uh, live people with lived experiences. I think it's disingenuous to think that you're going to uh, be able to mount a campaign to raise the type of money that a 10 council, a uh, 10 member council would dictate. So I would be very cautious about that. And then after 12 years, uh, if there was these term limits, you're like, whoops, I'm going to jump back into another profession. It's not how the world really works, I don't think. So there's a lot we have to consider, but I really appreciate this conversation, but I don't think there's a, a rush to do anything in 2022. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Evers? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I recall, uh, was it a year ago, we were having this discussion and we were we were discussing whether or not we were going to have a referendum and debating whether that referendum would be advisory or whether it would be binding and i supported an advisory referendum at the time but i recall that we had made a promise to ourselves and to the public and i think to the t fox task force that we would follow up at some point with a binding referendum, that we would not use the results of the advisory referendum as a way of dismissing the concerns that were discussed. And I, I think this item isn't so much for us to debate the, the recommendations of TFOX, but really whether or not we're going to move forward with what we promised the public we would do. We were going to use the advisory referendum to help shape the questions for a bonding referendum and put it to the voters. Now, what I, whether I think, uh, whether I'm in favor of a full-time or, or a part-time council, whether I agree with the recommendations and the rationale and the logic of the TFOX committee and the, and the product of 90 meetings over two years or, or not isn't really the issue. 
The issue is, are we going to follow through with what we said we were going to do? And I do think that there is a problem that an advisory referendum does not get the same attention nor the same level of engagement because it doesn't have the same level of urgency as a binding referendum would have. That said, I do think we've run out of time, and that's partly due to COVID. And perhaps it's become, it's also because council itself is not a full-time operation with a, with a chief of staff prepared to be able to keep everything on track. This slipped through our hands, and it's in many ways too late for us to mount a binding referendum for this spring for many of the reasons that have been mentioned. But I, I just want to remind this body that I believe we have promised the task force and we pretty much promised the public that at some point we would turn this over to the voters and do a binding referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Wheeler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think I don't want to repeat what other alders have said. And, uh, but I think Alder um, Benford said it well. And, you know, one thing I want to add is as elected officials, we are elected to hear the voices of our community. Our community spoke. Uh, they have given us an indication that they don't want any changes with the exception of the term limit. And the, the result is very conclusive. However, if we want to do something uh, and the question I ask attorney Haas is which items are more, uh, that needs binary, binary uh, referendum, and that was the sizes and the length. If we want to go with that, we can move forward with 2023 election where there's a city election, the mayoral uh, election, we can get more turnout, people are coming, because if we push now, to April election, that means we are disregarding the voice of, of our community, the voices that they guided us, that they don't want any changes. And speaking of diversity, Alder Benford said it well, that making the full-time council will not increase the diversity. If we have only 10 council members, you can imagine the limit that we can have for people to run for office. Secondly, if you think of the term limit for, you know, to increase the term limit to four years, what will happen to our student body who want to participate in this political process? What are we, we cannot be able to have them participate in that regard. So if an older um, uh, ever said that we owe to the community and we owe to the body that we promise them to give a uh, binary referendum. And if that's the way we want to go by, I think we can do more outreach. We can educate our community if we want to modify the questions, if the, if the questions were more confusing. But I think it's just misleading and it's unfair for us to rush something that's not fully baked to an election that will not have high turnout. So I will not be supporting any way to move forward. But if, if it was my choice, I would say the will of the power has spoken and we do nothing with this, except where we need to do the binary. But because we promised, we can move forward with 2023. So thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Curry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I hope to be brief in this, but I just wanted to share kind of pers perspectives. I agree with a lot of what my peers have said on both sides. Um, but in being respectful as being a new alder and knowing that uh, some of the decisions were laid out or discussions started before some of us even thought um, we were going to be campaigning or running for election, um, as well as engaging the public and having a non binding question. And now, um, again, uh, wanting to be informed by the public and by our constituents and those we represent um, to uh, reflect what they would like to see. I guess my biggest observation or uh, kind of <laughs> laughing naively at myself when I was campaigning of what I thought I could accomplish and now that I am in the role, um, uh, laughing a little bit at how naive I was. 
Um, but also the, the question in my mind is, how do members of the public, how do folks interested in running for a public office or those who didn't even know that that was their calling, have a true understanding of what the role is and what they are voting on? And honestly, until you've done the role um, or been a long serving volunteer, I think of multiple city processes and BCCs um, that answer, well, I would say majority vary um, based on that experience. And so um, I would like to point to the fact of looking at our structures of BCCs and um, knowing that we want to have a further diversification of lived experience, of identity, of culture, um, making processes to attend meetings and understand how to even serve on committees more accessible to members of the public. So more of us are making an informed decision. And then I think uh, alluding as well to staffing, um, I believe it was Alder Evers brought it up of not even having a chief of staff or having full office staff to get some of these things in terms of engagements with voters and making sure they understand what they're voting on. Um, so I understand both sides of the seat, but I think from my perspective as one of the newer alders, um, one more thing, I don't know council outside of virtual, and I can't imagine trying to attend the amount of meetings that I've been able to via Zoom in person, and I work downtown on the square, a walk away from the CCB. So again, making it accessible, uh, and if we are members of the council and saying that it's inaccessible for us and those we represent and those we think would be amazing leaders, um, that's the, fo the first focus in my mind to make sure that folks know what they're signing up for and know that there are inclusible and equitable accesses, um, ways to access those resources. Thank you, Alder. Alder Halverson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just looking at the resolution in front of us, it is asking to determine whether a binding refer referendum um, election shall be authorized. And we're talking about 2022, it sounds like. Um, I think that this is a is definitely a long term. The only the only two items, according to the attorney, that that require binding are the uh, length of service and the size. And those things, I think, education is going to be key to the voters and make sure that we have enough awareness of what changes we're looking to make that are very long term. So to try to do this, um, I agree with my colleague from uh, District 13 that we are out of time to even put together the questions that we would ask in order to get that binding. So I think we should take the time for the next 12 months and, and chew through this and get the right, if we're going to do this and put a binding rough around out there, we do it right. We do it on the 2023 when we know we're going to have uh, more turnout. I think turnout will be a concern if we're trying to get the will of the people. Um, I think this needs to be deferred until 2023 if we're going to make that choice at this point. So thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Foster? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's been great to hear all the discussion and feedback. Um, I guess just to start out, I'll say I, I, I do not support putting any binding questions on the 2022 ballot. Um, I, a couple things I wanted to um, I wanted to speak to, though, uh, I guess first the the concept that sort of the voters have spoken, and we should it would be somehow disrespectful to come back in the future with any similar or same questions. I, I don't agree with that. Um, I think the purpose of the um, of the non-binding referendum was to inform us. There was a lot of discussion about that when the previous council voted for this. And I, for one, am really appreciative that we did put these out there. I, I certainly learned something from the results. I think we need to be cautious to um, put too much stock in them, but I, I there was definitely information to be gleaned from it. So I'm glad that we did it. Um, on the other hand, I also don't actually agree that we committed to the public um, that we were going to come back and do a binding. Um, I just went back and looked at the the resolution that was passed, and it it pretty explicitly it, the only thing that it committed to was that the task force would bring back something for the council to vote on, and if it were approved, then it would be placed on the ballot. So I think, and as one of the co-authors of that resolution, the intent was to do the, the non-binding, get information, review it, bring back the opportunity to, to go for a binding uh, resolution. So I, I personally do not feel like we are in any way committed to doing that. And I think we should only do that if we think it's a good idea. Um, 
The other thing is that I think if there is interest in doing a binding referendum, which I think there are a couple things I could support in the future, um, I do think 2023 would be a good year to do it. Um, it does. Um, it's not as good as uh, Alder Furman said in terms of being able to, to implement those changes with the new uh, term, but it would be a mayoral um, election year, which has, you know, I think about double the turnout as a regular sort of council election year and certainly much more than a, a county board and um, school board election. So if, if part of the goal would be to have as many people as possible sharing their, their perspective, I think 23 would be a better opportunity for that. Um, and then briefly, I just wanted to kind of run through the four questions and what I gleaned from the results and what my thoughts are. Um, I, I do believe that for the question of the size of the council, uh, to me, that did seem pretty convincing. Um, and it, and it, I, I would not have, I guess, expected that. Or, or um, So maybe it did surprise me that 70% said leave it alone and 15 on either side said change it this way or that way. But from my perspective, without any sort of new information, it doesn't make sense to me to just put that question back as is on a binding rever um, referendum. So from my perspective, that, that one is sort of closed. Um, the question of full-time versus part-time, that was not uh, quite the landslide, but still pretty convincing at 5842. Um, the interesting thing with that is that, you know, part of what I really appreciated about this non-binding referendum and part of the point was to generate public discussion about it. And there were, you know, a, a number of forums. There were some really good discussions on social media of all places. Um, there, there, you know, I heard actually from a fair number of constituents about it, not as much as maybe I would have liked, but it, it, it did get these ideas in people's minds. And what I heard most on this issue was a real concern about sort of professional politicians and a, and a kind of association of full-time with professional. But then also I did hear from a lot of folks that they were supportive and would support increasing the salary of the council. They thought that it, for all of the work that was entailed, the current compensation really didn't make sense. So for, for me, for example, I'd really be interested in looking more into that. I'd love to survey current elders, maybe some you know recent elders, and just start with figuring out how much time do we all spend? What do we all think is a reasonable amount of time, even just to share with future candidates? Because you know there's a range. Clearly, some people spend more than others, but I think we should try and dial in what a what a realistic minimum amount of commitment it is. And then I think we should have a real conversation about compensation, and we should not be doing this and not making a living wage. It's not a good example for us to set, and I, I just don't believe in it in principle. So that's one that I'd like to take a look at. But again, that doesn't require a binding referendum. So you know, if if others are interested, we could work on that through TFOGS and come up with something to to potentially change that, and it might not even need to go to referendum. The question on term limits, um, in my mind, I was interpreting that as only if going to full-time. And so I did kind of discount the results of that, but I think Alder Benford makes a good point. Still a very high number, 75% said yes with that condition. But you know, I feel pretty ambivalent on this one. And if we feel like a majority of folks do want term limits, even regardless of the full-time question, I'd be probably willing to support putting that on a, as a binding question and giving people the opportunity to, to weigh in. Uh, and then the the last one is really around the four year terms. Um, you know, of all of them, that was really the closest. Fifty five, forty five. Uh, you know, given everything we said about the challenges of getting to folks, you know, who is really weighing in, how much information do they have? Um, I think that one also is really worth some more work, and possibly including on a twenty three binding referendum. Um, and a big part of it for me is uh, really based on my experience and coming in, you know, three years ago as part of a almost I think it was almost half of the council turned over then. And then this, this most recent one, again, almost half. You know, I think 15 out of the 20 of us have less than three years of experience on here. And like that's just not good. It's not good for us as an institution um, really guiding the city. It's just there's not enough history and experience on this council. And to have every two years potentially swapping out half of the half the whole council, it's just really destructive. It's way too much to learn. You know, it, it literally does take a full year just to kind of get your feet under you. So I, I think that one needs to get looked at some more. Um, I think I'd also like to, to look at the question of staggering terms. That could also really help and not have such huge numbers of turnovers. So we have a little bit more continuity. 
So um, I think those are the two I just wanted to put out there and I'd be happy to work on those as part of the TFLAGS implementation team, or I'm happy to work on those with others that are interested and um, you know, possibly bringing something back to the council for a, a 2023 uh, referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Furman. Thank you, Mayor. I'm I'm very appreciative of the discussion this evening. Um, I, I do want to apologize. Um, uh, we did try to get this meeting scheduled way way sooner um, than January, and, and just struggled getting people's availability and finding people's times based on committees, etc. Um, I'm so I'm grateful we're having this discussion now, but recognize that makes 2022 incredibly difficult. Um, I do want to point out to, uh, just some math that I was doing about 2023. You know, if we think we're lining up uh, four-year terms with mayors, uh, mayoral election, which is one of the things that has been talked about, um, that means these changes wouldn't go in effect uh, in until 2027. Um, so it's it's a lot. It would take a long time to figure. And you know, uh, Alder Foster mentioned the idea of staggering, which I think is also an interesting concept to look at. Um, I do think the advantage to go uh, putting these the uh, putting any uh, sort of questions on the ballot in 2023 um, is the ability to give us a lot more time to educate people. Um, I'll never forget when uh, uh, the chair of TFOGS, Eileen Harrington, came came in front of the council in, in October. Um, to talk to us about the ballot, uh, the results, and talk about the ballot referendum. Um, one of the things she, I believe she said it was two, it took her two years to finally decide after being involved in TFOGS that full time was a good idea. And the second I heard that, I already knew what the results were going to be on the ballot. Um, if it took somebody that was engaged in this work for as long as she was as chair of the TFOGS um, process um, to, to, to realize uh, the, the scope of this job. Um, and how important it is uh, for for it to be full time. Um, I, I knew that 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 the education was going to be um, impossible. Uh, next to impossible. Um, I will say personally, I'm not sure I'm a fan of any any ballot questions, um, whether it be in 2022 or 2023. I'm not sure we're going to get much radically different results. Um, I do greatly appreciate the stuff that Alder Foster said and do think there's an opportunity to really think hard about how we phrase it, which is what we were supposed to learn from the non-binding referendum. And I think there are things we can pick out and, and, and go with. Um, but I think you know one of the things that we made a mistake with, and I think uh, Justice Castaneo said, 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 said this really well, is I think we made a mistake saying um, full time because all of a sudden we got to this realm of professional politicians. Um, I think the thing we should have been saying all along is, should alders get paid for the time they spend on the job? Or is this just more or less a volunteer activity where we get a small small amount of money as as a thank you? Um, I, I think this work is too hard, um, too demanding, um, and 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 I think it's it would be important. I think it's important to compensate alders for their time. Um, I think one scenario I've had had in mind is the idea of you know people at their work saying, okay, I'm you know, can I make enough being alder and do 20% of my time as alder and 80% of my time in my job and take kind of a step back from my job and do part time. I think there are different ways to think about that, um, but I do ultimately think our current salary um, really doesn't measure up to the amount of work we put into it. Um, you know, Alder Curry mentioned BCCs. Um, you're going to see a lot more from the implementation work group uh, uh, early this year about that. Um, we have some some ideas um, that we'll be sharing on how to restructure our BCC system or figure out ways to restructure it. Um, but that is incredibly important to fix that. Um, I think the things that we've talked about at TFOG's implementation work group is if we don't do this, um, what do we do um, and try to address some of the other concerns that are in here? Um, and, and that could be everything, anything from you know possibly adding more support staff for council members. Um, that certainly comes out of cost, and I know we have budget issues, um, but I desperately think we need to do a better job with training and make that training available um, to people in the community as well if they're thinking about being alder. Um, right now, when you become alder, I mean, our, we, I, our orientation process has improved dramatically dramatically um, uh, since it you know from you know this this term was better than than last term but but it's still incredibly hard um, you get thrown into a job and you get about two weeks and and you just get thrown a ton of information night after night and you're just trying to take it all in and so you know thoughts that we had talked about at the TFOGS um, implementation work group is possibly starting those training sessions in January 
Um, if you're a candidate for the position, what better way of learning more about the position you're running for than having a training session every two weeks um, and coming to that training and you don't have committee meetings yet. And so hopefully you get an opportunity to learn stuff and you're not being thrown a ton of things very quickly. Um, then I also think we need to do a much better job of actually educating people, not just about how the city works, but how, 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 to, how, to, how to do the job. Um, it requires a great deal of learning about facilitation and and you know learning about dealing with residents' concerns. Um, I you know I, I I mentioned in the implementation work group I was at a neighborhood association meeting recently and um, they uh, <laughs> they made me uh, my uh, I thought it was a mistake but they made me the feature speaker for their annual meeting and uh, I know you know when I had first started if that happened I would have been incredibly nervous um, but. I, I was much more prepared many years into this job um, and, and was able to you know, really do a good job of summarizing what was going on and then answering a lot of really random questions um, that people had about different things that were going on. Um, I, I think it takes a while to get those skills. So I think you know, teaching people uh, you know, different ways to do that, I think is incredibly important and there are ways we can do that better. Um, and I think that also ties into the term limit stuff. Um, two years is way too short. I think you know you really, really get the hang of this job a year, year and a half in, um, possibly even two years. At the end. And even then, you know, I'm still learning things all the time. Um, so you know, I think uh, you know, from my perspective, um, I, I do think 2022 was rushed. I think there are a lot of issues with doing something in 2023, including I'm not I'm not necessarily convinced we're going to hear um, anything radically different. Um, I do think it, it it probably is a good idea to go forward with something in 2023, um, and, and be much more targeted about it. And I desperately do think we need to be looking at other ways to improve this job um, because it, it you know it, it may have a diverse amount of people that are involved, um, but it is not open to a diverse amount of people. It really isn't. Um, and I think, you know, um, it's it's just, there, it requires a lot. And I don't think everybody's getting equal representation in every district because of how much it requires and how much resources people have to, to give this job the time it needs. So um, those are my thoughts. Um, but I am, again, I really want to say how appreciative I am of the discussion this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, of Alders Bennett, and figure out coal in the queue. And then uh, I'm going to try and bring us to some sort of conclusion or at least next step. Alder Bennett. Thanks. I'll make this brief. But on, on the note of like next steps, I think that a lot of good points were brought up today. And I don't want those to go unnoted, um, especially those of which um, talk about like the concerns of like if we did go full time or did go. Um, for four-year terms, what are the implications of that and how that will affect representation? One thing that wasn't brought up, but that I would like to say that I think it is important is there's this idea that somehow going to um, four-year terms will make campaigning much easier since you don't have to campaign so often. However, I would argue that campaigning... Um, I wouldn't say it would necessarily get easier just by looking at how much more it would cost to even run a campaign of that nature. Um, and I'm still, and from what Alder Furman just said, I, I'm, I guess now I'm like looking back and I'm kind of confused. Are you saying that like, um, if we go that we're not going necessarily full time, we're just gonna increase our pay because that's a lot different than um, our than our hours are going to increase or de decrease from what they currently are. Um, and within the time that if we're not gonna go for this ballot in 2022 to 2023, I would like, I would hope that um, TFOGs, if they haven't already, um, to address some of the issues that would come up um, if we did go to um, full-time or four-year terms, um, particularly in terms of like representation and campaigning and um, how much easier or more difficult campaigning um, and representing constituents will become um, if we make those changes. Thank you, Alder. Alder Figueroa Cole. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor. Actually, I was just going to ask you, if, you know, what what will be that the next steps on this discussion? Because I agree with um, many of the things said and disagree with many of the things said, and, and um, likewise. But um, there, um, I mean, there's so many, many, many valid points that I I don't want to repeat. But one thing that I'm certain from my perspective is that regardless of, of if we are going to put this on the ballot or not, I just want to, I just want to have the option for this discussion not to be closed tonight. Like there's so much that we can we need to be doing in order to make this body better. And I I that's what I'm kind of, from the from the perspective of process, what does that look like to leave the discussion to continue? and address so many of the topics discussed here today. So that's kind of a question for you. Yeah, thank you, Alder. Let me take advantage of your question to mm -hmm. me uh, to to try and put a little structure around this. Um, we've, we've been fairly broad ranging in our discussion, which I think is appropriate. Um, but uh, ultimately there's, there's some, I think, uh, sort of initial specific questions before you. Um, and let me start by saying that um, the the way to answer any of these questions, if you wanted uh, the answer to be affirmative, would be to make a motion. Um, I think some of the next steps don't require a motion, and, and I'll clarify, but I, I think really the pressing questions before you are whether you want to go to binding referendum and specifically whether you want to go to binding referendum on the number of alders or the length of terms, because those are the two things that cannot be changed except through a binding referendum. Um, of course, you could go to referendum on other things. That's absolutely within your power. Um, it's not necessary. Right, so that's the sort of first question, and if if anybody wanted that to happen, um, you know, there's certainly uh, you know item seventy four is on our agenda. Um, you could wait for that item, or you could make a motion now um, to say that it's the will of the body to do something. Um, the other important question is which election, if you want there to be a binding referendum, which ballot do you want it to be on? Right, and that's something that, for obvious reasons, if you want it to be uh, this April, you have to settle almost immediately, right? Um, if you want it to be at a future ballot, it's less urgent to settle which future ballot you might want that to be. Um, but the other question that's before you, which is in some ways perhaps the most important one, is what other action do you want to take coming out of the, both the initial TFOGS report and the results of the non-binding referendum and the work of the TFOGS implementation group? Um, and that, I think, is actually where most of what I've heard tonight falls, right? That, and people have feelings one way or the other about whether or not there should be uh, a, a referendum uh, and when, um, but I've heard each person that that spoke. I've heard you talk about things that are wouldn't have to be on the ballot, and uh, and could fall into this category of other action. And and that category, I would suggest, is really um, has been to date the work of the TFOGS implementation group. And it, so options for keeping this conversation going. One, if you're interested in engaging it, you could attend those meetings. Uh, you could ask this president or a future president to appoint you um, to that group uh, to work on it. Um, you could ask that body um, uh, and or council leadership to schedule a committee of the whole to discuss some subset of these issues. Uh, if you really want the whole council um, to to discuss them in more depth, I think it, if you wanted to do that, I'd really recommend working with the implementation group to structure that conversation. Um, but there's it, there's 
I think no way that this is the last discussion of these issues, right? I think in in any scenario, the implementation group is going to continue to work on these issues. Um, and I I think, and based on the reactions that I'm seeing from Alders Foster and Furman, that uh, your input and and in fact input of every Alder would be very much welcome um, into that conversation. Um, and I think there's been a number of of good ideas that have been raised tonight. I'm sure they've been taking notes. Um, and uh, that those uh, notes and ideas will go back to that implementation work group uh, for further discussion. So, so it's a very long way, Alder, of saying that this is definitely not the end of the conversation. Um, it's more the middle of it. Um, and that the, the questions that need to be settled tonight, I think, are mostly around um, the questions of the two binding referenda possibilities um, and that other uh, issues... Uh, can and should, and I believe will continue to be discussed. Does that answer your question, Alder? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alder. President Abbas. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, you put a nice uh, direction for all of us, so I appreciate that. Uh, so I... I I uh, really appreciate all the colleagues hearing from them. I do think so but regarding question about the binding two question, full-time, part-time, I think so there's a really clear direction. Uh, the community doesn't want full-time. Uh, regarding term length, I think so. I agree with Oliver Foster. There might be some creativity message. We should think about it. Perhaps we can take back to TFOX committee and then we could discuss about it more in detail if 2023 is our target. And that's what I'm thinking I'm hearing from uh, most of my colleague. And term limit, perhaps the, the TFOX uh, report mentioned four years, might be we can think creatively and put three years. Now, uh, just, you know, sake for our argument, why not three years, why four years? I also agree with many of my colleagues we, we just get elected, and my personal experience also is pretty much similar along other alders. The first year take you a lot of time to learn, and then second year you spend six months, and then you're busy running in another campaign for next six months. Mm -hmm. So two years just pass really quickly, and uh, but it's, it's it will be it will be good to have at least more than two years, four, three. Uh, however, we could discuss more about it. Uh, we should bring this back to the resident as a binding referendum about the term limit regarding full time part time. Uh, I I don't feel comfortable as as myself bringing it back uh, regarding um, other stuff. Uh, I think so. I agree with my colleagues. There are many ways we could look into that. We could look into the paycheck hours and have a broader discussion. Uh, I know last time. Uh, uh, Alder Furman reached out to council leadership. We did a try to do a committee as a whole. We were not able to find time slot, but looking at the interest and comments from other alders, perhaps uh, if TFOX group can reshape uh, some question and discussion and we can give another try of committee as a whole and have as uh, only discussion around those topics and perhaps give some side of direction for next budget, how what we want to do. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, President Abbas. Alder Foster. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to make a motion that the uh, council charges the uh, implementation work group to uh, prepare a, a draft resolution authorizing um, referendum questions for the 2023 uh, spring election. Um, to bring back for the Common Council for discussion and a vote. Uh, Alder, can you do you want to specify the which referenda? I was um, maybe if I can get a second, I could speak to why I didn't um, specify that. Is there a second? Alder Furman will second. Go ahead, Alder. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, my thought was to basically leave it open. Um, I think let the the task force this feedback bring something that you know we think best represents what we heard tonight. And then obviously the council will have the, the complete authority to add things, delete things, change things, et cetera. But to, we would just do our best to try and put something uh, in front of the council as a starting point. Thank you, Alder. So again, the motion is to instruct the TFUG's implementation work group to draft 
uh, referenda questions for the 2023 April ballot? A resolution for the council to, to to do that right. So, you know, not again presupposing any of our opinions on whether we should ultimately do that or not, but just having that available. I, th I think we would, I didn't want to put a date on it, but I, at least personally, my goal would be to do that somewhat quickly because I think we, you know, we don't want to be having the same quest uh, discussion next January. So I think if we're going to, we should discuss this, take a vote on it as soon as possible. And then if there is will to, to do it, then we'll have much more time to prepare. Thank you, Alder. Uh, on the question then, Alder Furman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do I do want to at least add, even if it's not in the motion, um, I think, uh, you know, as the uh, the chair of the TFOX implementation work group, I did, I did hear a lot of uh, stuff and, and was certainly taking notes. Um, we will also be working on other things for the council to be talking about and thinking about um, and try to come up with, you know, a bunch of different things, even though it's not in the motion, that is, that is certainly direction that we're hearing loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, uh, say I strongly support this motion, and I also wanted to thank the mayor for uh, what she said earlier about attending TFOG's uh, working group implementation group meetings and actually reading the materials. Uh, will uh, you know even the report? It's clear that uh, alders have not read the TFOG's report, in, in based on some of the remarks this evening, and. Um, I, I think if if folks can be prepared and come to some of those meetings or even watch the recordings or read the minutes, we'll avoid having this conversation in almost its exact same form in another six months or whenever this comes back. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Wahilahe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A um, uh, question uh, for Alder Foster is the referendum for 2023 preparation are we focusing on just the two that we could, we should have as a binary or we are looking into the whole structure or those four questions? Uh, Alder, I think that um, that was my question as well. And I think Alder Foster clarified that um, he's specifically not specifying which questions it would be, but rather um, the instruction it, assuming the motion is adopted, the instruction would be from the council to the work group to take into account this conversation um, and draft a resolution that would come back to the council um, for approval. And that they would have to have the, the conversation about which questions uh, would be included. I, yeah, I understand. But my struggle is if we are if we are trying to create the whole referendum, or that's my my struggle in understanding. And perhaps maybe all the foster can clarify that. Because I, I will not feel comfortable uh voting for this, knowing that we are going to um uh, structure those questions, the four questions again. If if it's two questions that is needed for us to have the binary, then I understand, but I don't want to lump sum the other uh, questions. That's what I'm coming from. Uh, thank you, Alder, for clarifying. And, and certainly Alder Foster can speak if he wishes, but um, I think if that's your concern, um, at this point, I'd recommend voting against the resolution. Uh, the resolution is is purposefully nonspecific. Um, so if you feel like you need to know what the questions would be before you could support that, um, then I, I would vote again at, against it at this point. And, and depending on the outcome, you'd be free to offer another motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Figueroa, call. Yeah, I just want to thank um, um, Alder Foster and, and Herman and even you for, for the clarification earlier. But that's exactly what I was looking. I just want the conversation to continue. And I think the TFOX is the right place for it. So I am in total support of, the, of that um, proposal. Thank, thank you, Alder. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, then just to clarify, it's been moved and seconded to, uh, and Alder, I'm not going to get the words exactly right, but to instruct the TFOGS implementation work group to draft a resolution um, that would approve referenda questions for the 2023 ballot. Um, that's the motion before us. So all those in favor, aye. 
those opposed, no. Uh, as your name is called, then I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Alder Halverson? Aye. Aye. Alder Harrington McKinney? No. No. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Alder Limmer? Aye. Aye. Vice President Martin? Aye. Aye. Alder Mayadze? Absent. Alder Revere? Aye. Aye. Alder Vitavir? Aye. Aye. Alder Wahelier? No. No. President Abbas? Aye. Aye. Alder Aboras has left. Alder Benford? Is that an aye? Aye. Alder Bennett? Aye. Aye. Alder Carter? No. No. Alder Conklin? Aye. Aye. Alder Curry? Aye. Aye. Alder Everest? Aye. Aye. Alder Figaro Cole? Aye. Aye. Alder Foster? Aye. Aye. Alder Furman? Aye. Aye. Madam Mayor, I have 15 ayes and three noes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. With 15 ayes, um, that resolution or motion passes. Um, and we'll ask the work group to bring us back something. Um, and I'll just encourage uh, all to engage in those conversations at the work group level. Um, I think uh, uh, not just on the referenda, but on uh, all of the above. Um, all right, so that brings us back to item 47. And give me a moment to get the correct pages and screens in front of me. So item 47 is uh, Legistar 68084, adopting the South Madison plan as a supplement to the comprehensive plan and directing staff to implement the recommendations contained in the plan. Uh, we do perhaps uh, still have registrants here. Um, our reg the only registrant wishing to speak is Jim Winkle of District 13 in support. Hi, um, I have two comments about the South Madison plan. The first is an improvement to the Thorstead concept area, and the second is about density along John Nolan Corridor. So the goal of creating housing as a means of community wealth building in the Thorstead area is a good one. I understand how the racist policies of the past have gotten us here today, and I'd like us to try to right those wrongs. Um, my wife and I are regular donors to the ONIC program, which helps uh, especially Black folks purchase homes. So with respect to the plan, I'd like to offer, I'd like us to offer more housing in the Thorstead area so that more people can benefit from wealth building through home ownership. This is a really unique opportunity we have. I can't think of any other place this close to bus lines and downtown where we could create so much relatively affordable housing. How do we do that? Um, plan for more townhouses, row houses and condos and fewer single family homes. I have a friend who lived in a great neighborhood in Chicago filled with affordable four-story condos and apartments. And there are many nearby amenities, a grocery store, library, hardware store, entertainment, community gardens, many restaurants, and mass transit galore, all within walking distance. We always found a parking spot on the street when we visited, and that speaks to how few residents even bother to own a car. There's just simply no need. So related to that, Todd Littman is a respected urban planner who writes about smart growth. Here's a almost direct quote regarding transportation costs. Quote, studies found that households in transit-oriented and smart growth neighborhoods own fewer vehicles and generate fewer trips 
than they would in automobile dependent sprawled areas, providing large savings. Analysis of travel survey data indicates that central city households spend about a third as much on motor vehicle repair as suburban residents. So these savings are partly offset by additional transit expenditures, but still result in thousands of dollars in average net savings. These savings increase one's disposable income, especially for low income households, end quote. So transportation is a significant part of one's budget, as we all know. Uh, and that's really why I'd like us to encourage more relatively affordable housing in this area so we don't push people further out where they have no choice but to rely on a car, which costs money. Park Street is a major corridor with most of the amenities I mentioned above, with the exception of great transit service. Um, however, bus rapid transit is coming and that'll help. This is going to be a really desirable area in which to live. I live just north of the planning area, and as people are priced out of my area, some will look a little further south into the South Madison area, which will become gentrified if we don't provide enough housing for all. It's actually already happening. The law of supply and demand is a real thing, and it crosses economic boundaries. The city just passed zoning changes to encourage the missing middle in housing, so I say let's plan for more of that, and even higher density makes sense to me too. Second, and very briefly, I support the proposed density along and near the John Nolan corridor. Thanks. And that's time. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Helen Kitchell of District 13 in opposition available to answer questions and Justice Castaneda of District 15, neither supporting or opposing, but available to answer questions. Are there questions for any of our registrants? All their ever's. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I'd like to ask Justice Castaneda a question. Uh, Can we Ms. Justice? Get, give Justice yeah. a moment to get in. No, I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, thank you for joining us. Go ahead, Alder. Yes, uh, Justice, um, you as the Executive Director of Commonwealth Development, are, have you been paying following along with the work that's going into the South Madison plan? Uh, I mean, I don't know that in the past, in professional capacity, I have done that. I've been very involved in a number of other capacities. Uh, you know, You're familiar with, with it, academics. correct? Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, do you have some thoughts about the Thorstead uh, concept area um, relative to the issue of appropriate levels of density and the issue of transit-oriented development that the previous speaker, Jim Winkle, referred to? Oh, uh, well, okay, so there was a lot that was said, right? I mean, I think one thing I can speak to is the home ownership concept. And like there's a, the history of home ownership as an institution is not one of just, you know, having people get into homes and therefore they got wealth. There was an institution that included a number of racist practices, and you know, uh, many even the servicemen's or the original GI Bill uh, government-backed home ownership loans, which were used you know, specifically to target areas that have racial restrictive covenants, racist lending practices. I mean, there's a number of things that happened that made home ownership more about exclusion uh, for folks of color than it was about a way or a path. And so, despite the history. There is still this kind of thinking that like we need to create more home ownership, which will then therefore lead to wealth, which doesn't hold by itself. And so I, I think that that's really important. However, there's a number of things uh, that the previous speaker brought up that I think are right, right? Like having a number of different types of housing, I think is really important. I personally, uh, and I, you know, different day we can get into it, but I, I don't think that this housing of all types thing holds up because of a lot of the spatial segregation in Madison. However, um, focusing on density, especially with your lowest income uh, units, having access to transit, I think is really, really smart. And wherever you guys have an opportunity to do that, we should be doing it um, all over Madison, but definitely on the South side. So uh, I don't know if that's specific enough or what you meant. I mean, there was a lot, I mean, the previous speaker said a lot of things that I think are absolutely true. I guess when you have an opportunity to create density with low-income housing, I, I always take back the concept of low-income. I think it's really important that we're doing that. We're very deliberate about doing it, especially in areas like the Park Street Corridor. 
Well, thank you, Justice. Thanks, thanks for being there, and and uh, thank you for all the work you do in our community. Oh, appreciate you guys. Thank you, Alder. Are there other questions for any of our registrants? All right. If not, then um, President Abbas, let's start with a motion, and then we have a staff presentation. Move motion to adopt. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt, and uh, we'll start with a presentation from uh, Jeff Greger from Planning, and go from there. Jeff, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I just want to give a brief overview uh, of the South Madison plan. Uh, it, it's a lot more than just the Thorstad site. So uh, just for everyone's benefit, uh, hopefully I'll spend five or six minutes going over it, and then we can get into more specifics. So just for everyone's reference, the planning area is the area south of Winger Creek, generally north of the Beltline, west of Lake Monona, uh, and east of Fish Hatchery Road. Uh, the plan focus, uh, there are three guiding principles uh, of anti-displacement, gentrification, community wealth building, and opportunities to thrive. Those three general principles or guiding principles were used uh, to evaluate um, the plan recommendations and strategies. Um, and those are arrived at through uh, a robust community participation process. We had over 20 public meetings. Uh, it was a mix of in-person and virtual uh, due to COVID, uh, but we held our typical open house style meeting, uh, worked with some neighborhood partners to put together neighborhood action teams uh, that met four times and th those were made up of folks who don't typically engage in city processes. Uh, we also held uh, art walk and talk, a bike and talk, uh, and uh, two social practice artists were hired again to reach out to those segments of the South Madison community that don't typically uh, participate in, in these planning processes. Um, the plan is made up of uh, these uh, five chapters, economic development, housing, land use, transportation, and parks, equitable access and capacity building, and then the Park Street Corridor. I'm not gonna go through this whole uh, list, but these are some of the top issues and concerns that were brought up through that, uh, uh, the, the planning process. Uh, and, you know, gentrification displacement is by far probably the, the issue uh, that we talked about uh, the most throughout this process, but we also talked about affordable quality childcare improving the ped bike infrastructure, uh, improving the parks, uh, as well as transit service. Uh, I have just have a series of maps that I'm gonna flip through rather quickly here, but we can come back, circle back and talk more in depth about some of these uh, recommendations. Uh, we have a future land use map. Uh, generally these uh, changes on the, the land use map outlined in black, um, are in response to a recommendation within the plan or one of the focus area concepts. There are a few in here that are kind of clean up uh, from the comp plan, like uh, Badger Rock uh, Middle School going from general commercial to special institutional. Uh, we do have a zoning map. I just wanted to point out that uh, the plan does not recommend any proactive rezoning of city properties. However, uh, with the town of Madison uh, coming in, uh, attaching to the city of Madison in October of this year, the plan does make um, zoning recommendations for those town parcels, uh, similar to how um, other attachments of other towns have, have gone, a similar process uh, was used to arrive at, at these recommendations. Uh, the plan has a height, uh, maximum building height uh, map to help guide uh, development uh, when and if it does occur. Um, and it is reflective of, uh, again, the community input that we heard. Uh, we're also showing uh, priority street connections. Uh, connectivity was uh, another uh, big issue that, that we talked about. So we're highlighting here three priority street connections within the, the plan and then some uh, additional secondary. These relate more towards uh, the focus area concept plans, which I'll get to in a minute. Also, as I mentioned earlier in, in the top uh, issues and concerns, uh, ped bike uh, infrastructure. Uh, so we're showing uh, some additional path connections, uh, additional on-street 
connections uh, in the plan, as well as we looked at uh, gaps in the sidewalk network uh, in relation to uh, access to uh, transit um, lines, both uh, current and the future BRT. Uh, I mentioned uh, we uh, focus, the plan has uh, three focus areas, concept focus areas. And so the plan looks at uh, Village on Park area, the Thorstad focus area, and then the Perry and Ann Street focus area. Uh, just going to quickly go through these. Um, so the, the, this is the Park Street focus area. We're looking at both sides of Park Street, um, showing uh, new street connections. So an extension of Buick Street, extension of Fisher Street, and Hughes Place, uh, reflecting the changes at the Village on Park with the Urban League's hub project. Um, and then some other um, aspirational um, type uh, recommendations uh, for the block south of Hughes. Um, one of the items brought up uh, during the planning process was the need for more park space, uh, especially at Penn Park. So this concept shows a potential a way to expand Penn Park in the future. Um, moving on to the Thorstad site uh, or Thorstad focus area, it is much larger than just the Thorstad uh, property. Uh, there's recommendations for mixed use um, buildings along Park Street, along the uh, future BRT route. Uh, and then uh, I'll get into the more into the this recommendation of uh, a new neighborhood uh, at the Thorstad site in a minute. The final uh, focus area uh, was the Perry and Ann Street, again, focusing on uh, connectivity with uh, overpass connection of Perry Street over the Beltline, connecting the north side to the south side. There are a lot of uh, employment opportunities south of the Beltline, uh, and this uh, recommendation is making more of a direct connection to those jobs from the, the neighborhood to the north, uh, as well as uh, creating some additional uh, street connections uh, within this uh, neighborhood, uh, while offering up some opportunities for uh, employment along the Beltline and Ann Street, and then transitioning uh, back into the neighborhood with some uh, low medium residential and, and medium residential. I mentioned the Thorstad focus area, I get into that recommendation a little bit more. Uh, this has been the number one uh, discussed uh, recommendation through the boards, committees and commission process. Um, so I'll go through a few more slides about how we arrived at this and then kind of break down uh, what the what is actually in the concept. So this is what the community said uh, or told uh, planning staff through these uh, public meetings, uh, what we've heard through the process. So displacement and gentrification is occurring today in South Madison. Um, there needs to be owner occupied housing, uh, build something that people can purchase. Uh, there's been decades of neglect, redlining, and, and frankly, discrimination uh, in South Madison. Uh, asking why all the housing units uh, have to be rental units in South Madison. South Madison residents are already surrounded by rental apartments. Um, the desire to build affordable housing. Um, and then um, the last one is the hope the city uh, takes into consideration South Madison is a neighborhood where uh, we should focus on ownership because of the, the history and legacy of housing discrimination against black and brown folks. Um, and the, the desire that South Park Street not look like uh, East Washington. So what does the data tell us? Uh, in South Madison, approximately 20% is ownership, 79% rental, whereas city of Madison, it's Closer to that 50-50, it's 53% renter, 47% ownership. Uh, this, these pie chart data comes from the ACS five-year uh, survey. Um, as far as the breakdown of housing types in South Madison, it's 29% single family, 67.5% multifamily. We did break out the mobile home uh, from the single family. Uh, there is a significant amount of uh, mobile homes uh, in the South Madison study area. Whereas the city of Madison, it's again, closer to that 50-50, 52% single family, 47% multifamily. 
uh, during the planning effort, uh, the city hired a marketing or a market study consultant. Uh, and as part of their uh, work, they put together a housing demand. Uh, and they used two methodologies to look at how much, uh, how many housing units South Madison could uh, absorb over a 20 year period. Uh, their methodology one uh, was using kind of a high low projected units uh, based off a proportional share of, of the housing units uh, in South Madison um, based off of uh, growth projected citywide. And that methodology methodology shows between 924 and 1847 units. Uh, methodology two uh, compared South Madison to a comparable area that was experiencing growth and they chose East Washington. Uh, with that methodology, they felt, uh, or they, in their judgment, uh, South Madison could absorb about 2,260 units. Uh, within just the three focus area concepts, um, staff is estimating uh, around 2,127 units could be realized um, at build out of those concepts. And then looking at other potential uh, redevelopment areas within South Madison, another 600 to 800 units uh, could be realized. Uh, some of those areas would be along um, uh, the John Nolan Olin uh, Triangle area, uh, as well as uh, some other areas um, along uh, Badger Road. Uh, just want to also point out uh, the South Madison study area is 975 acres. Uh, of that, the Thorstad site comprises 24 acres. So that's about 2.46% of the study area. And that's within that red outline that is um, on the concept plan that I showed on the previous slide. Uh, and Thorstad of the entire city makes up 0.04% of, of the entire city of Madison. So we are talking about a, a fairly small area of, of the overall study area when we're talking about the Thorstad site. Uh, this map is showing a uh, percentage of single family home by census tract. Uh, if you exclude uh, the downtown and campus area, um, South Madison comes in at 24%. And uh, if you exclude that, uh, the downtown area and campus area, um, it's relatively uh, low percentage of single family housing as compared to other parts uh, of the city where near 75, 80, 83%. Um, so how did uh, staff uh, arrive at this plan recommendation? This is not where we started. Um, staff put together an initial set of concepts that proposed 4,000 plus new units of housing. Uh, and those concepts were skewing heavily towards multifamily uh, as the predominant form of housing. So that those initial set of concepts uh, comprised about 3% single family with and 97% uh, multifamily. Uh, the revised concepts, which are the ones that are in the South Madison, the draft South Madison plan, those revised concepts, 11% uh, uh, is single family, and 89% of the housing proposed uh, is multifamily. Um, we had an initial set of meetings uh, in June where we um, had three concepts for each of the focus areas uh, with different levels of um, disruption or uh, redevelopment proposed in those concepts. And again, those were the initial set with uh, that were skewing heavily towards multifamily. The community uh, took a look at those uh, and directed staff to go back and revise the concepts to show more owner-occupied housing. And, and, and for your reference, those meetings were recorded. They were virtual. They're, they're on the media site uh, for public viewing um, in case you, you want to go back and look at those. Uh, so based on that, um, Input from the community staff evaluated a number of locations where additional owner-occupied housing could be developed. Um, and to be able to do it um, in any way, shape, or form, there would be need to be a significant amount of city investment, likely TIF, uh, required to make this happen. The Thorstad site was chosen for a few reasons. Uh, it would not displace uh, any residents. Uh, there would be minimal displacement of businesses. Um, when staff ran the numbers, uh, it was determined that a, a, a city TIF investment could likely be recouped 
within a 10 year period. Uh, and that and the Thorstad location is adjacent to a school and uh, uh, city parks, uh, ideal for developing a neighborhood. So what's in the concept? Um, I guess I, I wanna first and foremost say this is a concept. Uh, it's not set in stone. Uh, with any of our our, our plans uh, that the, the that planning puts together, uh, there is some flexibility uh, on the on the makeup of these plans, the ratio, number of units, that sort of thing. I also want to mention we are showing a variety of different housing type options here. We are the the, the concept plan does show single family lots. In this concept, those single family lots are four thousand square feet. The concept's also showing cottage homes, which are smaller homes, you know, somewhere 1,000 to 1,200, maybe a couple are a little bit larger, uh, where they would be owner-occupied, but they would be, the, the land would be more in a condo-type um, situation. Uh, and then also showing uh, townhomes, owner-occupied townhomes, uh, as well as uh, uh, apartment buildings along uh, Park Street. So there is a mix of housing types. This is one suggestion of the makeup of that. But depending on when or if this gets um, developed, uh, the housing, the market may determine that the ratios need to uh, be switched up a bit. And that is possible with what you see here in the concept plan. So the overall net density uh, of this Thorstad focus area concept is uh, roughly you know, 16.01 uh, units per acre. Uh, and that's net density that's taking out parks, stormwater, and right away. Um, so again, the overall site is, is just under 24 acres. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess I just wanna reiterate again, this is a concept plan, there's flexibility, it, the, the the takeaway is there is a variety of housing options uh, within this concept. So with that, um, I will uh, be available to answer uh, any questions you may have. Thank you, Jeff. Are there questions for staff on this? President Abbas. Oh, Jeff, thank you very much. Uh, very exciting plan. Uh, I, uh, just looking at the plan, I think so we should do the same for the north side of Madison too. It's, there's a lot of opportunity, so really well done. Could you please, I saw uh, Aldo ever send an email and he also mentioned about certain changes in the plan. Could you please explain how that plan is different than yours? In which area? Just visually, if you can bring that slide back. Sure. Well, yep. where you have 23 acres, I believe that's... Yep. Yeah. So uh, where, uh, so this is the plan that's currently in the South Draft South Madison plan. Uh, the alternate plan that Ever, uh, Alder Evers is proposing uh, has a, a few modifications. One, uh, so going back to the height map, the, the height map, shows a maximum of five stories for this area. So these purple buildings would max out at five stories in the, 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 the concept you're seeing here. In the alternative plan, uh, the height map would need to be changed for this area uh, to allow for eight stories that would allow more units within these purple uh, apartment buildings or mixed use buildings. The other way it differs is the townhomes that are proposed here, uh, are made smaller. These are fairly generous size townhomes of around 2,200 to 2,400 square feet. Uh, in the alternative plan, uh, the size of the townhome unit would be about 1,500 square feet. So the, the size of these townhomes would go down. Um, townhomes uh, would be proposed uh, as a transition from the taller eight-story mixed-use buildings to the um, single-family lots. So these uh, single family lots would go away and be replaced with townhomes at that 1500 square foot unit size. And then the last change uh, in the alternate plan is these 4,000 square foot uh, single family lots would be reduced to 3,000 square feet. Uh, 
netting us actually some additional uh, single family lots by by reducing the size of the lot. But in, in essence, that's the difference between the, the draft plan and the alternative. And then President Rose, let me just point out that we don't actually have a, a motion before us on that. And and so we, we will have an opportunity to come back and ask sure. additional questions for staff, assuming a motion is made. Okay. I can make a motion to adopt this. Uh, we've got a motion to adopt on the floor, um, but we're still on on questions for staff. All right. Um, so just just uh, assuming that there will be an amendment, a motion for an amendment made. I'm just letting you know that we'll have a chance to come back. So I don't certainly if you have other questions, you should go ahead. All right. No, no worries. I will then wait. <laughs> Thank you, President Bus. Alder Carter, questions for staff on the plan. Um, yes, Jeff, what is the Thorstead and adjoining properties zone for right now? Um, I believe the land use is employment and there would be some some sort of zoning uh, regarding employment. If you give me a second, I can switch back to the zoning map and give you a better answer. So uh, Thorstad property, which is this, is zoned CCT, and then the properties behind it are zoned IL, so uh, I believe that's light industrial. Um, and then the, land, the current land uses, well, the land use in the comp plan shows this entire area for regional mixed use. Uh, to make the concept come to fruition, the recommendation in the plan is to change the area in the black outline from RMU uh, to an area of uh, low medium residential and then an area of low residential. And currently we do not own the land, correct? Correct, correct. It's under private ownership. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You other Alder Wahila hey questions? Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, if you go back to the uh, the pie chart uh, comparing the renters and homeowners. So I'll get there. There you go. So my question is if this um, plan is adapted, will any of those uh, ratio change? They will likely change, but I don't believe in a hugely significant way. Um, again, the the three concepts are showing you know an additional eleven percent. Uh, when you add up all the units that the three concepts um, are proposing, it, it's only eleven percent. Um, of the units uh, would be single family. And then when you add that to the existing housing stack that's there, your percentage will go down a little bit. You may see the needle move a few percentage points, I would imagine, at you know once everything's built out. Um, but again, this is a, a fairly small area when you consider the overall study area. Um, but, you know, uh, this was a community-led plan, and, and the community uh, loud and clearly um, expressed the desire for having more ownership opportunities. And it was also loud and clear um, that they would like to have single-family uh, detached ownership opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Heck? Questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, Jeff, you may have just answered my question, but on the slide that you spent some time on where the original concept was 4,000 housing units and then evolved from there, uh, you spent a lot of time talking about that desire for more uh, uh, multifamily, I mean, less multifamily uh, housing, but and you also spent a lot of time talking about home ownership desires primarily. Um, 
I mean, and it seems like in the discussion, a lot of times those are used interchangeably, single family with owner occupied. Um, is it true that, that, you know, in your opinion, that residents were, were really asking for uh, single family homes or were they really asking for home ownership opportunities? Therefore, it could include multifamily residences that were owner occupied like townhouses or condos of various types? I'm going to say yes to both. Um, we've heard feedback generally that we'd like more ownership opportunities. When we presented these concepts to the, the neighborhood, those initial concepts showed opportunities for owner occupancy through townhomes and row homes, as well as apartment buildings. And at those June sessions, and again, those are recorded. You know, I, you can take my word for it, but you can also go go look at those and listen to them. It was very clear uh, to me and the other staff on the team that they were also specifically looking for single-family detached opportunities um, in South Madison. It's kind of two pronged. They, the community, asked to preserve what's there today because a lot of those homes are getting bought up and converted over to rental. And the other other ask was to create more opportunities for single family residential detached homes. And did you, did you hear some support for the idea of condos, townhouses, even though you may have eliminated some of those? And so, I mean, yes, we, we heard, positive feedback on townhomes and, and condos. Uh, we've also heard from the development community that uh, it's still very, very difficult to get financing for condos. Um, and so, you know, the, then the option becomes townhomes and row homes. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, when I, I was going over the concept, we are showing townhomes. We're not showing this all as townhomes, um, but again, this is one idea, you know, and these ratios could change. This whole block could be townhomes, uh, and some of these cottage homes could migrate over here and you end up with fewer single family lots. It, it really depends on when this is developed and, and the, the current state of, of the housing market. Um, so, you know, Again, for me, the takeaway is this is a concept and it's showing a variety of housing and there is flexibility within this concept to change those ratios um, when we get more of a detailed plan in front of us. To Thanks. And just one, just one more quick related question. Um, because you're, you're forecasting perhaps the usage of TIF or other uh, city financing for, for this area, um, it's true that it won't necessarily be only market forces that, that determine the type of housing. The city will have a little more say than, than what would be the case if it were purely private development, right? Correct. Yep. And for a private developer to do something like this, it, it doesn't pencil out. Uh, you know, it's going to require city investment. It's going to likely require partnering with a nonprofit to be able to do something like this. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder Evers, questions? Yes, Mayor, and real quick, and Alder Heck kind of um, asked my question for me, and, and that is that if we, are, if we recognize that the investment in this concept area creating this neighborhood is gonna require a tremendous amount of investment, it'll be very costly, It'll be a, a market intervention using TIF and the Affordable Housing Fund and other strategies. We have, do we have another example in South Madison, uh, say in the Village and Park area, where it's been determined that we can create home ownership with a different building form than single family? I, I seem to recall the CDA is doing just that in Village on Park. Could you talk just briefly about that? Sure. Let me bring up that concept real quick here. Uh, so, I mean, again, in this concept, uh, we're showing, uh, so this is the northern side of the Village on Park site. 
so this low medium residential that likely could be uh, a townhome. Uh, this is a medium residential, a, a two to five story building. Uh, this could have some sort of home ownership uh, possibility uh, in it. Uh, the, I, I believe the idea is the CDA would, it would be a CDA project. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the exact format of, of the makeup of that building, uh, I think is still up for discussion, but that has been an idea that's been floated is to create more owner occupied housing on, on the Northern uh, portion of the village on Park site. So in other words, through land banking and through the city's potential ownership of the property, we could have a say in, in, in how the, how the, in what kinds of building forms and uh, housing forms get built. And if we want to emphasize that there be some single family housing, but also some other duplexes, triplexes, townhomes, townhouses, row homes, those kinds of things, the city actually can work with a nonprofit developer or even a for-profit developer and cast a vision forth and get a partner to do this, correct? We're not relying solely on a private developer telling us what to do, correct? correct. Yeah, if the city is involved, the city can can uh, put restrictions or requirements on how this gets developed, what type of housing, that sort of thing. Similar to other projects just to the north here um, on the Truman Olson site. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, questions? Yeah, um, Jeff, if you can show, the, when we had the community meetings, one of the things that the residents all agreed on was the multifamily housing up at the Villager and potential uh, multifamily housing built by a private developer, which would be behind the Villager, was the place to have that, correct? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm understanding your question. You're talking about this area here right? and, and this area here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, we, we did look at this area as an area uh, potentially for uh, uh, similar to what is being proposed on um, the Thorstad site with some single family or townhome and row home owner occupied. Uh, the numbers didn't pencil out. There, there's a number of apartment, two story apartment buildings already on that site. Um, and, you know, when we brought this to the community, they, they felt, uh, I guess I would offer that they felt comfortable with this sort of type of idea for redevelopment of, of that apartment site. You could net additional units um, on this property, make more efficient use of the property uh, in developing it as multifamily or medium density. Um, similar to, and, and they also like the idea of, of the CDA uh, doing a project on the north side of, of their property. And one of the things that throughout our community engagement meetings was really emphasizing having a variety of housing stock. Am I correct, correct on that? Correct, yep. Uh, throughout this, um, you know, we, we explain, you know, the different types of housing stock and, you know, the need for a, a variety. And again, on, on Thorstad site, I would argue we are showing a variety of housing types. They may not be in the exact proportions uh, right now, but again, that is that is flexible. And so um, with South Madison being heavily multifamily uh, right now, it, it makes it very difficult to pencil out a project where you could redevelop it into single family. So again, that's why the Thorstad site was shown that way, um, given the current uses today and and, and any sort of viability that a project like that may may have. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett, questions? Hi, yes. So um, I understand that many residents are hoping to um, 
purchase um, detached housing, um, as you stated. Um, what is the um, guarantee that the city um, will provide that if we put in single family housing, that will actually serve the people of whom we are hoping it will serve? So I guess the, well, there are no guarantees in life. I guess that's a, a full <laughs> cliche, but um, let me get to the concept here a little bit. Um, so the idea, again, uh, you know, to make this work, there would need to be heavily, heavily city involved uh, with this. And as Alder Heck was getting at um, and Alder Evers, the city would be able to dictates maybe a strong word, but dictate kind of the program here. Um, if we work with a nonprofit, if the city purchases the property, puts in the infrastructure and hands it over to a nonprofit, that nonprofit would be required to develop these homes at a, a certain uh, uh, level of, you know, a, a cost for the home. And, you know, the city could say it needs to be, meet a certain affordability range um, so, I mean, that's, you know, really the guarantee that we have, uh, within the housing chapter, uh, there are a number of strategies and recommendations that talk about perhaps a community land trust, uh, being, uh, used, uh, in, in a portion of the site, uh, to also maintain affordability into the future. Um, so there are a number of recommendations, uh, in, in the, the housing chapter as well that that could be used here as well. Looks like right. Matt. May yeah, I think uh, Matt Walker wants to add something. Um, I, I would just say um, the most similar example we have of this is Mosaic Ridge um, um, off of Ally Drive. So that was a similar example where the city purchased land and there was a desire for the neighborhood to um, add back some single family homes with a specific goal of making sure that people who lived in the, the neighborhood had access to home ownership. And so we ran a year plus home ownership, uh, a home buyer education program um, that was mostly made up of people who were renters in the neighborhood um, to fix credit, get them prepared, connect them to lenders and builders. And we did have a number of people who were renters in the neighborhood buy, but as Jeff said, it, it's, not a, it's not a guarantee. Um, we can't we can't say unless you, you know, rent it in this neighborhood, you're not allowed to buy a house here, but we can do things to sort of make it, to proactively encourage, offer um, home buyer education, certain subsidies to, to sort of pave the, the way for people to, to buy in the neighborhood. So we have done it. We've, we've worked with nonprofits to do similar things in other neighborhoods as well. Um, has those programs helped increase um Home ownership of people of color, because that's that's essentially what we're saying here is that like we want black people to black buy these homes so that they can build generational wealth, which we haven't had the opportunity to do so before. So, I, so, I'm so I'd say like so like we can't run a city program that would um, only allow certain certain people, but we can we we have proactively marketed. We've been very successful. And Mosaic Ridge um, of selling houses to um, a wide variety of households from all sorts of income groups, races. Um, it, it, we have been successful again through very kind of proactive marketing efforts. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Are there any other questions for staff? All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, so uh, the motion is to adopt the plan. Um, we're on to discussion and Alder Evers, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move an amendment uh, that I, the gist of which I sent out to colleagues and is posted on Legistar. And uh, the amendment calls uh, to swap out the original Thorstead focus area and swap in the Thorstead focus area alternative, 
which was articulated by staff in response to BCC input and included in the presentation to the Plan Commission on December 13th. And secondly, to change the land use recommendations in the Thorstead focus area alternative for sections A and B from low residential to low medium residential, which will still allow for single family detached homes, but also allow for other building forms, including townhouses and row houses. And uh, if there's a second on that, then I can speak to my. Thank you, Alder. Is there a second? I think Alder Figueroa Call will second. Well, thank you. Um, First of all, I want to say as a co-sponsor for the South Madison plan, for the adoption of the South Madison plan, that I strongly support the plan and believe it to be a, a tremendous uh, advance for this part of our city, this critical area of the city. But I do believe these modest changes uh, will make an, an important improvement uh, and changes specifically to the Thorstead area. I note that in Jeff's presentation, he acknowledged that the comp plan uh, for the Thorstead area just three years ago when it, the comp plan was established had recommended regional mixed use, which is the city's kind of highest, most dense uh, classification. And that as a result of the South, now in the South Madison plan, it's recommended in the Thorstead area, low residential, which is 180 degrees uh, switch which is the reason why I and some others, including Alder Foster and several others in our community started to raise questions. If it just seemed like a very dramatic switch, particularly in such proximity to uh, South Park Street, and which will be a future uh, bus rapid transit line. Uh, the interesting thing about the alternative is that it actually increases opportunities for home ownership. It increases, in fact, the number of single family detached homes by, by 11%. It increases home ownership if you include uh, the townhouses that have been stipulated for home ownership with those single family homes. It increases home ownership possibilities by 32%. And overall density is increased by 66%. But actually, as Jeff said, there's no reason why all of the units within the Thorstead area couldn't at some point be home ownership uh, possibilities. Why is that? Because CDA is planning to have an owner-occupied affordable housing multifamily project that was just described in the northern section of the village on Park. So, and the second part of my Amendment changing the low residential section of the Thorstead concept area alternative to low medium. It would increase the low medium zone units significantly from 44 to 159. But what that means is that while we could still have single family homes in this area, it would not be limited to single family detached homes, but we could also have the more townhouses, row homes, duplexes, triplexes. Uh, small apartment buildings, uh, those kinds of things that were create more home ownership possibilities for more people. And I really think that's what we're talking about. Owner ownership, in fact, is the key and it's the big advance in this plan. But we need to be careful not to make the mistake of conflating or making equal somehow or another home ownership with single family housing. There's no reason why we would want to limit ownership only to those who purchase a single family home. The key question before us, why shouldn't we expand the option of affordable wealth building to a greater number of our residents, particularly given the high cost and the relative scarcity of public resources that we're gonna have available, particularly in, in these tough budget times. We've been told it's going to cost a lot to subsidize these units. So let's be efficient. Let's get more bang for our buck. It's indisputable, colleagues, that right now Madison is facing a profound housing crisis, a shortage of housing, and it will only get worse if we do not concentrate our efforts on expanding housing options and increasing density in future neighborhoods like Thorstead. It's an opportunity for us to do something new. It's also indisputable that we are in a global climate crisis. 
Single family homes are less energy efficient than townhouses, for example. And if we are going to emphasize low density residential in Florstead, that necessarily requires that we build more housing away from transit. And that will not help us meet our climate goals. A variety of affordable housing options and building forms, including single family, but also townhouses, row houses, small to medium multifamily owner occupied apartment buildings would effectively combine the goals of resisting gentrification and displacement, which were articulated so much in the public engagement sections and still allow for generational wealth building. In fact, it's a fallacy to, to that single family homes in Thorstead in and of themselves will somehow stave off gentrification and displacement. Gentrification is related to affordability and the plan recognizes once again that the Thorstead neighborhood, this project, this, this concept will require significant public investment, investment that will be necessary to mitigate or push back the deleterious impacts of a speculative real estate market where gentrification is what happens when you have an opportunity to sell your home to the highest bidder and you have more people wanting to do that and they take advantage of low and more affordable areas and suddenly you have uh, wealthier people moving into what was previously a low income neighborhood. We wanna add density to this area to efficiently expand affordable housing home ownership to a greater number of South residents, South Madison residents, not, uh, not just a few, but as many as practically possible. Simply put, we would get more bang for our buck by offering a greater variety of housing forms. And yes, there is some variety, but we should add a greater variety of housing forms, all geared towards affordable ownership. Staff recommendations for the original Thorstead concept area do not jive with the direction the city is currently taking and embrace for transit-oriented development. The plan recognizes that transit-oriented development is necessary for the success of bus rapid transit. We know this. It's also essential for the success of brick and mortar retail along South Park. We know this as well. The plan knows and, and, and states that healthy re, a healthy retail mix makes for a walkable neighborhood, makes for a desirable place for residents to live. In other words, we need a requisite amount of density for the success of BRT and for the future vitality of a neighborhood like Thorstead. I understand the need for home ownership as a means of generational wealth building, but it's not necessary that we weigh, weigh this or weight it down in favor of single family homes, particularly in direct proximity to the future BRT line. Um, I'll conclude by um, just reminding folks that we are, we are actually increasing single family housing with the alternative, we're increasing home ownership options, we're increasing density. And um, I'm gonna wrap up because I, I wanna allow time for discussion and I'll just, I'll just say this. I have a, a tremendous sympathy for the argument that racist policies in the past implemented by banks and allowed by our city have limited home ownership options, including single family homes for black residents in South Madison. But as Jeff has said, and as, as Matt Walker has underscored, we are restricted as far as the city's ability and we're restricted by federal housing authority guidelines on how we can explicitly redress, offer redress on the basis of race. But I do believe, and I would challenge all of us in our role as policymakers, that with careful planning, we can and must embrace our shared values and policy priorities around racial equity, affordable housing, and climate change. And it's imperative that we don't make the mistake of placing these values in opposition to each other, but instead work diligently to harmonize them for the greatest extent possible. Racial equity, affordable housing, and climate change are shared goals that we can, we should really emphasize in, in the Thorstead concept area and all our planning moving forward. So I encourage you to vote in favor of this amendment to make these modest changes and an otherwise very uh, top-notch and excellent plan. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, we have a number of alders in the queue, but because I did promise a chance to ask questions uh, on this proposed amendment, 
Um, I'd like to turn to Director Stouter, um, who I believe has a little bit more information um, and open it up for questions for staff, and then we'll continue to take the queue. Um, if we Thank have you, you here. There you are. Yes. Thanks, Mayor. I will share screen and just show um, a couple of visuals so that folks have a sense of uh, the impacts to the plan of the proposed amendment. Um, so in a sense, there would be uh, three changes to the plan and all within the area of the Thorstad site, which is shown here. So as, as Jeff um, talked through before when looking at the draft plan components, um, one change would involve the future land use recommendation. Uh, right now, as shown in the draft, it's largely a low residential designation, which is up to 16 units an acre um, with a small area for low medium residential up in this corner here. Um, Alder Evers amendment would uh, change the future land use recommendation to that low medium residential, which is up to 30 units per acre um, for that entire site. Um, the second change then, um, this is, this is the Thorstad focus area concept. Again, just a concept that's shown in the plan today. As Jeff mentioned, it's about 15 acres in size and developable area. Um, here shown are about 240 housing units. Um, with the amendment being brought forward by Alder Evers, um, this is the alternative concept. And this was presented at the plan commission as well. This is, again, the same developable space of about 15 acres and about 400 housing units. And, and again, Jeff talked through this, pointing out the, the differences, but just I want to go back and forth one more time so that you have a sense of the, um, the, the change involved. Again, just for reference, these lots here are about 4,000 square feet in size, single family lots. And if you scroll to the alternative concept, you can see that they're skinnied up a little bit. They're, here they're 3,000 square foot single family lots. Um, and then there are uh, you know, more townhomes in this area, taller buildings right up against South Park Street, et cetera. The third change and final change would be to the maximum building height map in the plan. And that would entail um, raising the maximum building height from five stories here right, right south of Winger Creek on South Park Street um, up to a maximum of eight stories in that same area. So I just wanted to be able to, to show those visuals in case they, they help address some of the questions that, that folks might, might have in advance. And I'll stop sharing there. And I think Jeff and I are, are still both available if there are other questions. Thank you. Um, so we'll do questions for staff on this. Uh, first, and I'll just go through, but if you don't have a question, I will absolutely come back to you for discussion. So, Alder Wahilahe, is it a question? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Heather. Could you please go back and explain the first two slides? I know you talked about uh, the stories changes, the length of the, uh, um, the um, story uh, from five to eight, but before that, yeah, right there. The first two slides. Yes, yes, Alder. So the this is the future land use map, which is a very general um, map that really sets the framework for what the future land uses can be, um, at, you know, all across the planning area. Um, shown here in this area that I'm, I'm showing now with my cursor is the, the reach of the Thorstad site. So this is at a different scale than the other maps. And it simply shows that right now, the draft plan recommends um, largely low residential, this lightest yellow color. Um, and this is a mix of single family homes and, and town homes um, up to a, a maximum density of about 16 units per acre. In this small corner up in the, up in the upper left corner here is shown as low medium residential or LMR. And that's a maximum of about 30 units per acre. So it can accommodate some small multifamily buildings, certainly townhomes, and, and as well as some single family uh, lots. Um, with Alder Evers' amendment, the Thorstead site as a whole would be shown in that slightly darker yellow color, the low medium residential, which would again just set a different uh, density framework for the expected long-term future land use within that area. 
So that's the first slide. And then did you want me to go on to the concepts as well, the differences yeah, yeah, between them? Yeah, before you do that, uh, in the other slide, light yellow, you talked about how many units per, per acre, but with this dark orange, how many units per acre uh, in terms of the townhomes or apartments? I'm not sure. So, so the general density range would be up to 30 units an acre um, maximum within our low, medium residential density range. Okay, thank you. Sure. And then uh, again, just moving on to the concepts so that you can see them visually. Um, this, is, this is the draft plan as it stands uh, today. Again, 15 acres of developable land uh, shown with about 240 housing units total in a mix of, mix of housing types. And then the alternative concept uh, on that same chunk of land, about 15 acres of developable land, we have a, almost 400 housing units um, with still a, a mix of types, townhomes, um, single family. And, and this would be, uh, again, up to an eight story instead of a five story building um, along South Park Street in this area to achieve um, some of that density increase. Does that get to your questions? Yeah, thanks. yeah thank you. Sure. Yeah. sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, is it questions? Thank you, Mayor. Heather, what does concept mean? Thank you for asking that. I, I think it is important, again, as Jeff mentioned, to reiterate that either one of these alternatives is just a concept at this point. You know, if the city already owned land, perhaps we would be able to go into greater detail um, and, and be more definitive about what the outcomes would be on a particular site. I think it's, it's always a challenge for us as planners to try to make sure that the images shown in our plans and our city's adopted plans are meaningful to folks. And sometimes the way to really illustrate what can be done is to come up with a, a hypothetical concept that, that can really... Um, that I think people can actually connect with and have an understanding of what uh, land uses could fit in with that general land use, uh, future land use recommendation. And so we, we took a stab in, in good faith at, as planners at laying out a, a street network and a mix of housing types that, um, that reflected what we were hearing back from the, from the community. But either one of the concepts, whether what's in the draft plan today or the alternative um, put forward by Elder Evers, I, I do wanna say that it, it's very unlikely that the long-term 10, 20 year land use would look exactly like either one of those. Um, and so we're, you know, I, I think it's really important for the council to realize that the city may never see exactly what's shown in either one of those concepts, but both of them can be illustrative of what our general future land use recommendations are saying. And I think, um, you know, the the one that's shown in the draft plan um, was the one that uh, was uh, really clearly vetted most by many of the community members throughout the public engagement process, but they aren't far apart in the big picture. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty close together. Thank you. Thank you, other uh, President Abbas, is, is it a question? Yes, please. Go ahead. So Director Stauder, what is the existing zoning there? So the existing zoning in that area is industrial and uh, commercial corridor transitional. So, you know, what, what we're setting forth within this plan would be a very different future land use recommendation than what exists there today um, in, in zoning. Um, you know, in, in the, the mix of zoning districts that would really need to be implemented to see this come to fruition would be different than the underlying zoning that's there today. So similar to, you know, in the Oscar Mayer area within District 12, uh, the zoning that's there today is, is industrial, industrial general, sort of our heaviest industrial district. Um, as you're really familiar with, you know, in order to see a lot of the recommendations in that plan achieved, the, the underlying zoning will need to change in the future. Yep, that makes sense. And, <laughs> excuse me, and at the, at the plan commission, Alder Heckmake, uh, slight amendment to the plan uh, at additional language. Could you please explain that? What was that? 
Sure. Um, Alder Hex Amendment, which was uh, recommended by the plan commissioners or by the plan commission as a whole, um, was a change to the narrative in the plan that acknowledged that you know the concept that's shown on the Thorstad site is flexible, and that as time passes, um, you know this could take again, this could take 10, 20 years to actually come to fruition. As time passes, um, the exact nature of what's going to happen on that site it is flexible. There may be a different mix of housing types that the the city would um, be involved in um, implementing in the future. And so, it, the the amendment that that Alder Heck put forward at Plan Commission simply reflected that in the narrative of the plan. Um, but the Plan Commission also then considered the alternative concept. And in the end, uh, did not vote to put that forward as part of the plan, but rather to um, to simply add some flexibility in the narrative. And Alder Heck can certainly follow with, with more detail if he'd like to. So what I'm understanding is with Alder Heck Amendment, and this is just a plan document, and when the real project will come, might be there is total different dimension. We'll see the, uh, so there is flexibility in this plan. There, there is some flexibility in this plan, as with all of our plans. I think that that, you know, that the future land use recommendation of low residential or low medium residential really does set a framework for what we expect to see there. But within either of those land use designations, we could see a variety of housing types, um, single family lots, townhomes. Um, in the case of low medium residential, more of that small multifamily could be a, a part of it as well. Sure. And, and last question is, probably you or Matt Walker can answer that, is about those condos and the concept of having condominium and owner-occupied condominium. Like if cities involved in, have ever city involved in any condo projects? So uh, how, how does that market is and how much, I'm just having a hard time to understand the city role in concept of condominium. Sure, if, if, Matt, if Matt is here and wants to take yeah. that, that would be, Sure. So um, okay. uh, um, off of Broadway, the CDA was involved with a large development where we were, um, we, we did a tax credit development. Um, and next to it, we also uh, helped develop a, a series of condominiums. This was largely sort of before the Great Recession when it was easier to, to finance condos. But we continued the project and, and finished it in about 2013. So it's it's similar to any role where the CDA is the developer. So see the CDA has developed and owns apartments. We've done single family homes, but we've also done condominiums. And so acting as the developer, we sold unit by unit, and then eventually we're no longer have any sort of ownership or control stake other than um, financing tools or land use restrictions that we would have left on it. Um, as, as was mentioned, um, before, there's nothing mechanically stopping us or, or the market from developing condos. It's largely, uh, it's hard to get a bank loan to do condos at this time. It's just much easier to do apartments um, given the lending environment. And then uh, there's also post Great Recession additional restrictions that are put on the buyer side of condos and make it a little bit trickier, but there's ways around this, um, and we've worked with people to to purchase condos as well. Mm -hmm. that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. And Heather, one last question about the size of the lots, uh, 3,000 square feet or 4,000, or, you know, during community engagement process, uh, because there was a really large community engagement process happened in quite a big period of time, what was community input about single family homes and, and size of the lot is also interesting to me. What was their input as a community? Well, I'll turn to Jeff if there were any specifics on that. I, my, my thought is that we didn't delve so much into the specifics of lot size. I, I will say that um, before, before Jeff chimes in here, you know, a 3,000 square foot lot is the very smallest single family lot that the city allows in any zoning district. It, it's quite small. Um, I think a 4,000 square foot lot, many might consider it also quite small, but it has a, a little more room for things like detached garages, driveways, et, et cetera. Um, I think with, with the 3,000 square foot lot, um, you know, 
Jeff put together some really great images shared with the plan commission of where some of those uh, exist today, those very small lots. And if you imagine a lot of shared driveways or very skinny homes, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that in older parts of the city as well as brand new, um, you know, uh, examples on the edge uh, of, of very small single family lots, but they're still fairly rare at, as a whole in Madison. And Jeff, I, I'll, I'll turn to you to, to see if there was any feedback or, or input throughout the process on the, the size of lot. Yeah, so when we put the revised concept together, the one that um, is in the plan, uh, we, we did point out to the community that these were 4,000 square foot lots. They're smaller, on the smaller size, as compared to your average city lot. Um, we really didn't get a whole lot of discussion about lot size. It was more important to the community that there be the option of single family lots, whether they're 4,000 square feet or 10,000 square feet. Um, we, we picked that 4,000 square foot number, um, you know, knowing that this is in, you know, close to downtown, it, it's along a transit corridor, trying to get a little bit more density in there, but also trying to have the ability to have single family lots. In, in Heather, uh, regarding 4,000 square feet, we recently passed ADU, um, you know, permitted use with 4,000, if somebody had 9,900, not 9,000, sorry, 900 square feet house, and if the surrounding boundaries is still, they can still construct ADU within 4,000 square feet. Yes, and they they also could on a 3,000 square foot lot if the buildings were small enough, you know, to, to meet the lot coverage and open space requirements. But um, we right now, um, with the recent passage of the accessory dwelling unit ordinance, there isn't any stipulation that your lot has to be a certain size in order to construct um, an ADU. Okay. That's fair enough. All right, thank you very much for answering questions. Thank you, Alder. Um, let's see, Alder Bennett, is it questions? Go ahead. Yes, questions, and then I'll come back later for comments. Um, I have a question, I guess for Heather. Um, so I understand that you were um, explaining how the, um, the, Images that we just saw um, might not be actually what we see later on 10, 20 years from now. However, is it safe to say that like if we go with the current plan that if, if a developer were to come to um, that neighborhood wishing to develop uh, condos or townhomes, that it would be more difficult to change the plan after the fact so that they would be allowed to build such a development? I think it depends on the, the scale and the extent of the project that you're describing. I, I think it is very likely that the private market is not going to jump on this opportunity because of the cost of the infrastructure, the new streets, and the relatively low uh, return on the investment. You know, this is not a 12 story building on this large site. What we're showing is uh, a mix of relatively low density housing types, um, you know, that, that um, generally can support home ownership. Um, but I think behind the scenes, what we're really assuming is that in order for this to come to fruition or something similar to it, the city is going to have to take that initiative and be heavily involved in that development. And, and so, you know, I think it is unlikely that a private sector developer would come in and want to do something exactly like what's shown in the concept. And I also think it's unlikely that they'd want to do something slightly more dense than what's shown, like like townhomes uh, across the uh, across the site. Um, we'd have to respond to that if it came forward, um, and we we certainly would. The plan commission and ultimately the council would would be involved in that decision. Um, I know that's that's a roundabout answer to your question, but I, I think I, I think it's again, I, I think it's unlikely that we'll see in the near term um, a private development uh, consistent enough with the plan in order to to support it as staff. Mm -hmm. So like either way with this current or the alternate develop, you don't foresee developers looking to invest in that area 
Um, and either way, the city would need to be heavily involved. Th that is the staff assumption at this point. I, I think that the city would need to be involved um, and, and help to take the initiative to see either concept um, come to fruition. And as I mentioned earlier, I think the, the concept that's in the draft plan now is the one that was heavily vetted and, and most embraced by uh, those that, that our staff team um, were most involved with throughout the process. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder Heck, questions? Yes, uh, likely for Heather. Uh, Heather, you we, we've kind of mentioned a couple of times about uh, whether or not a future proposal, let's say, conforms with with the plan. So, in 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 particular, with regard to the land, future land use map, th there are density ranges attached to each of those categories, and I, I know there aren't really density recommendations any longer in the zoning code. Um, are are the density recommendations in the future land use map? Uh, fungible, um, you know, it, if, if a, isn't it more about form than density um, in, in, with regards to the map or is it, is it both? So if, if, I guess it's somewhat related to Alder Bennett's question. Um, if something were to be proposed that were higher density, but vaguely the same building form, would that um, be likely to be considered uh, plan compliant? It, it could be. I think it depends on that magnitude of departure from the density ranges. And so, you know, you, you're on the plan commission, you know that we face this about every two weeks with slight differences from um, what adopted plans, um, underlying adopted plans say. I think that with within the low medium residential and the low residential uh, land use, future land use recommendations, um, there's a little bit less Play. I mean, we're expecting that those buildings are going to be one to three stories in height. Um, there's a lot more variation when you look at our mixed use districts and our mixed use land use recommendations, um, often because they they defer to a height map that that is in an adopted plan. Um, and so, I, I you know, I, we're really trying to lean more on height and less on density ranges for especially for our mixed use areas. But for these low, medium and, and uh, low residential areas, I, I think it is pretty typical to see those density ranges adhered to and as developments move forward. So the the boundary density wise between low residential and low medium residential is a little bit firmer, but there's always room for play maybe is a good. Yes, I, I think that. Yes, that's well said. OK, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miadze, questions? Yeah, just a quick question for Heather. Um, have we ever done a demographic uh, breakdown of um, how many uh, uh, on the south side of Madison, how many uh, people of color own, you know, as far as a single family home versus a condo versus a uh, uh, townhouse? Um, given that the study showed that a lot of people wanted single homes, which is different from uh, townhouses. Just wondering if you guys had a breakdown of that. No, we don't have a great breakdown by race and housing type and ownership versus versus rental for specific areas within the city. And that's because what we're really relying on is the census data or the annual American Community Survey data that's just done based on a sample of, of Madison residents across the city each year. So we have decent data um, when you look citywide but when you really dive into a smaller geography, the data gets gets really messy. Like the margins of error on that data are so great that we can't mm -hmm. count on it uh, very well. But what we do have, um, and which Jeff showed in a slide, is is really just data on home ownership period for that area, and data on housing type, so single family versus multifamily housing within South Madison. We, we don't have a good breakdown um, by race within those categories. Okay, I, I just, I, I guess it's a question and then just a comment to hopefully to go with it, but I think it's important and imperative as, as uh, one of the things that um, 
that affects the African American community is to to have their own house and have that ownership. So I, I think it's important to actually if, if uh, people Alder, are, it, we're we're still in questions. Okay. Yeah, I I, I just want to urge the city to actually have some kind of demographic breakdown, especially when the census is done. If we can get something in the near future, that would be nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, is it questions? Yes, it's a question. Heather, how many um, neighborhood plans or um, area plans that you've done? I don't need the number of ones you've done because I know you've done a lot. But from the point of adoption to the point of fruition, how many have stayed the same? That's a great question. I, I think it's a tough one to answer, Elder Carter, because so many of our sub-area plans are laying out 10, 20, 30-year framework for what the land use could be at, at any one time. Now, there are some exceptions. Um, we've had some very small, geographically small plans um, that I've been able to experience coming to fruition during my time with the city, which is less than 15 years. And, and one example is the Royster Clark area. That was a, a pretty dramatic change from an old fertilizer plant into a, a you know, a, a neighborhood that is still developing. It's a mix of single family homes and three to five story mixed use buildings so far. There's still room uh, room for more development within that plan area. Um, you know, another one that'll be interesting to, to, uh, to time, to, to kind of measure over time is the Oscar Mayer special area plan. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a, a major transition of that area. Um, if we look at our, our regional malls, East Town and West Town both, I imagine that those plans will take decades to come to fruition, but, on the, this, this plan is really different because it's dealing with an area that's largely already developed, right? Like, like many of our other sub-area plans do, we're looking for the few opportunities for redevelopment within um, a broader area that's already a developed part of the city, or, or in this particular case, the town coming into the city. So, you know, it, it's going to be a matter of decision-making on the part of hundreds, literally hundreds of different property owners as far as when when, when it's time for them to make a, a decision about redevelopment over time. I think the Thorstad site specifically is a pretty unique site within this plan area because it's one that we do envision as a city, a pretty dramatic change for moving forward. And it has the acreage to, um, to become something to, you know, significantly different. Um, but I, it, it's really hard to guess on time because it, again, it's a collection of decisions of hundreds of individual property owners um, that that really uh, feeds into that overall timeline of, of implementation of a plan. And they might have their own ideas for their property. Certainly, they, they certainly will yeah. and, and market conditions will change over time as well. All right, I see no additional questions for staff. So thank you. Um, and now uh, we're on the amendment, the Evers amendment regarding the Thorstard uh, alternate. And I'm just gonna check through the hands that I saw raised uh, initially, and then we'll go on in the queue from there. Uh, Alder Wahilahe, did you wish to discuss? Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, I, as I look at this and based on what has been discussed and knowing uh, Southside Madison, how it has been really neglected in terms of the black communities who live there. Uh, we talk about disparity. We talk about uh, how equity plays in the marginalized communities. And looking at the what was presented in terms of the uh, the pie chart, that you know we have seen a lot of disparity. We have seen the uh, the rental uh, for the communities who are living in that uh, south side 
is 79% uh, versus 29%. And Madison, the rest of Madison is 50, 50, 47 and uh, 50. Uh, when it comes to home ownership or multifamily, it's 60% versus 29 for Southside Madison. And uh, the rest of Madison is 47, 57. So we are seeing those disparities. And we are policymakers and we keep on using the word equity, social justice, and how we can empower uh, black wealth or communities of color, how they can be able to build wealth, economic development, uh, affordable housing. We have to be true to ourselves when we say what we are saying. And as a policymakers, we can't just have the cake and eat it. We can't say something and then do something different. Uh, we've seen the units uh, that pro was proposed is 16 units versus 30 uh, units. Compared also is 240 units and 400 unit, single units. So we are trying to compact this marginalized community. We are not allowing them to have a space where they can raise their children, where they can be themselves instead of compacting them in a small area and not affording them for the wealth. You know, we're talking about climate change. How can we talk about climate change when they cannot even have bread on their, on their table? We are talking about, and I always look into the word, the words needs versus wants. We are talking about good for our backs or how the city can be more strategic in utilizing the funds for this community while we're just suppressing them, oppressing them, and we're not giving them the opportunity to be who they are, how they can raise their kids. Look at South Southside Madison compared to Madison. It's unforgivable. And we're talking about climate change. We're talking about racial disparity. And we shouldn't be using those words if we don't really mean it. And it's really this heartbreaking to see that, you know, we are thinking, compacting them in one area and not affording them the home ownership that they really need. The community did focus group and community outreach, they spoke. And we have to listen to them. What is the use of us being a policymakers if we cannot be able to listen to the voice of those who really need us? So I, I would encourage my colleagues to vote against this amendment by Alder Evers. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Uh, Alder Carter, you were next. Thank you, Mayor. I want to urge my colleagues not to vote for the alternate. When I approached the residents in South Madison to participate in this community engagement, the response was, why should we? We participate and you guys do what you want and we get nothing out of it. At every community meeting, I said, we need your opinion. We need to hear your voice. We need to know what you want. We need to know what you need. This is your opportunity. This is your time at every meeting. The residents spoke. There's not an opportunity to buy homes in South Madison. Many of the homes have become rental and other homes have not left a family who owns it through inheritance. The opportunity 
to leave South Madison and go to, to the peripheral cities and, and, and suburban areas is greater than staying in South Madison. It is very important. If we want to gain and, re, and gain and retain the trust of this community is that we acknowledge that their participation was valid. That we acknowledge that their participation was valid. There was over 20 meetings where all different heights, types, genders came forth and gave their opinion. They wanted a variety of housing, and that is what the South Madison plan shows, a variety of housing. Now, again, this is a concept. So we know as policymakers, 10 years from now, because of the economy and other factors, we might not be able to do these concepts. We might get close. But this is what they said. Older residents wanted more senior housing. Younger residents wanted more single family housing. That is what was said. And for some reason, we want to discredit what they said and their participation for everything else that we believe as we sit in our own houses saying you don't deserve the way you said you wanted it because we know better that your participation was great and we appreciate it but this is what we're going to do Let me help you help you that's what it feels like. And this is what they predicted. And it saddens me because this is an area that every time we want to know what you want, we go to South Madison and survey the folks. Every time the university wants to get some data, they go to South Madison and survey the folks. And then what do they get out of it? Well, they get to participate in a survey. And if they say they want to have a dry cleaners, guess what? The dry cleaners never materialize. And I'm just using that as an example. We talk about equity. We talking about marginal communities. We talk about listening, but we don't listen. And excuse my dog, we don't listen. But this is the time that I say, let's listen. Let's retain their trust so that in the future, we can come back and we can say, we listen. And even in the concept, even, excuse me, even in the comprehension plan, plan of a few years ago, I remember one of the resident teams said that they wanted to know if we were going to have, um, where was it that we were going to put in an LGBTQT community center? Well, that wasn't part of the comprehension plan, but guess what? We put it in the plan because we listened. And I think that's vitally important. What this plan is doing, the amendment, is not listening, is saying we know best. Thank you for participating. And that's not what you do to a community. South Madison speaks five languages. It is the most diverse area in Madison. 
And let me be the first to say, it was the only place that African-Americans could go when they were ran out of Greenbush. The only place. And they've made it a community. They've made it a community for themselves. An area that nobody goes to. They might come to an event in Penn Park, but I haven't heard anyone say we ate in South Madison. And that's okay until you bring up an amendment that says, thank you for your participation, but we know better. And I have to reflect on the fact that Thorstad is only 3% of this South Madison plan. Only 3% of this South Madison plan. And I'm, I'm not gonna give you the percentage, Alder Rahili did that already, but it made me think as everyone was talking, Alder Conklin stated a few weeks ago, and I'm paraphrasing Alder Conklin, so you can correct me if you want. When the Odana plan came up, she asked Heather Starter, this is just a concept, right? Heather's reply was yes. She came back and said, this is not a zoning change, correct? <laughs> Heather Starter said yes, and the Odana plan passed. This is no different. A vote for this amendment is telling the people, the residents of this great city, that your opinion doesn't count. And that's what it is. When you bring up climate change and every other kind of change, which is vitally important to our existence, but you're telling them your opinion doesn't count. And this property could turn into another car dealership for all we know. But I want you to think about what you're going to tell the residents of South Madison, what you're going to tell the residents of District 14 when you cast your vote. Because that vote is going to determine how we engage, how we retain their trust. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett was next. Well, I think that was really eloquently stated. Um, and um, inspiring. Um, nonetheless, um, there was a question asked about what we will say. And here is what I would say. I would say that I, I truly do understand where you all are coming from on a personal and on a scholarly level. Um, coming from a, um, my dad's side on a Black family, um, we are descendants of enslaved people. My grandfather did fight in World War II and was not able to buy, um, use the FHA loans to purchase a home because he was locked out of that because he was black. And that's, and I can go through my family line and see how um, redlining and discrimination has affected my family and our economic well-being. Um, and this is really what led me to study these issues. So, um, no, I don't think that when UW comes in, they're just studying it just so that you can be a part of a survey is to fully understand these issues that we are facing so that we can make the best policies to combat them. Um, in, even in my final project this year, I studied the redlining, and urban renewal efforts that we have done in this city. Um, I actually sent you 
um, one of the um, studies that I used for this project. And I found the legacy of redlining, even just looking at that map, absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting um, how the redlining that took place in the late 1930s affects us to today. How um, the city failed in the Greenbush urban renewal development. And how even today, Black people are suffering from that. Uh, from a 2018 study, Black people of all economic levels are denied loans at double the rate as white people. Nonetheless, I find it disappointing that the only home owner ownership opportunities we as a community foresee as us be, as being purchasable is the 1950s white man's dream of having a single family house with a white pig of fence and a golden retriever running around in the backyard. I don't understand how we think that buying in to that dream and to that idea is the only way for us to experience economic growth. We've seen the dismal effects that single family housing has had on the US as a whole and on us in Madison. Housing stock is low. People in the black community like have literally almost zero to none opportunities to buy um, to rent affordable housing, to buy um, affordable housing. It's just not there. And it's because of that white man's dream of their single family housing. So yes, I understand. I truly, truly understand where we're coming from, why we want to build economic growth. But we need to come, we need to understand how their dream impacts us and how we need to combat that by sharing in our wealth. We can still own a home and have food on our table and share a wall. We can, we can buy condos, we can buy townhouses, we can share in our wealth. The white man's dream of a single family house is not, is not the only way that we can build ourselves up. So I see where we're coming from and how the idea that of um, gentrification happening in this neighborhood and how we see all these developers coming in and building all these grand luxury apartments up, um, how that contributes to gentrification. We're not saying that's what we want here. We're saying that people can have other opportunities and have um, more opportunities for home ownership. And this idea that we're completely ignoring the community to vote for this amendment runs under the assumption that all of the community input is dismissed. This, um, this alternate offers very, very mild changes in which there will still be single family housing opportunities for residents. Um, and it also engages with the understanding that we need to have more density and we need to share in our wealth. So I think that none of this can happen without the city making significant investment in home loans and other programs so that black people can get these homes. Um, and that also reminds me that we are wanting to have these single families homes in this community so that black people can own these homes. And there's still no guarantee that black people will be buying these homes. So at the end of the day, I understand where residents are coming from. Nonetheless, I cannot support um, just funneling in a ton of single family housing, knowing the issues that that has caused with the legacy of redlining 
and how we need to combat that and how that this alternate addresses that. Thank you, Alder. Uh, President Abbas, you were next. No, I will skip that, looking at the time and the hand raised. Thank you, President Abbas. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm glad that there was uh, someone speaking between um, Alder Carter and my speaking. Um, Oh, Alder, you've muted yourself. I'm not going to repeat it, all the that has been said before, but um, I took a walkthrough of the new um, uh, apartment building that Commonwealth built uh, in the neighborhood of Meadowood. <clears throat> and when I walked through those apartments, I was simply um, uh, amazed. They were they were large. They were spacious. They were beautifully decorated. They had huge closet spaces. The room you can walk through and peep and um, and the the tenants loved that space. And one woman said, "This is the first time that I've ever been the first person." in this space and she loved it. Um, I, I have heard of the uh, five stories to eight stories and, and I've heard all of that, but what I'm looking at is, um, um, so I came from St. Louis I, and we had uh, Pruitt Igo and it was a building where it was density and they stacked people on top of one another. I know we're talking about um, a single family dwelling, but I'm talking about the concept of packing people together, and that that concerns me. Um, and I'm going to to read something that the uh, that all alders got, and it said, "Let's not undo the work that has been done." At least someone thinks that that came from me. That statement didn't come from me. That statement came from Dr. Ruben Anthony, who is the director of the Urban League of Greater Madison. And he goes on to say, no planning process will be perfect, but when the process is diligent, a diligent one, one that expresses the will of the neighborhoods and citizens, the plan should be supported. And so that's what I'm going to be I'm going to be supporting. Um, intellectually, we can prophesy and we can say everything that we want to say, but in the bottom line is who is going to live in these developments and these apartments whenever they go up. And if the people who took the surveys, who came to the public meetings, said that this is what I want, this is what we want, Who? why is that not workable? Why are we not listening to that? And that's the challenge that I have, is, is that, um, and the alder said it quite eloquently, is, is that when you ask people what you what they want, they're not talking about red, like all that historical things. Yes, it happened. Yes, it happened. But when you ask someone who has not even had the privilege of living in a, in a house or whatever, what is it that you want? And they express that and express that loudly. We should be li listening to that. Final, final uh, comment is just that when we... Um, uh, built the Employment and Training Center that's over across from Elver Park. Um, Jim and his team came in and he asked the people what they want, wanted. We couldn't even get, uh, initially, we couldn't even get 20 or five people to show up in regular meetings. But when Jim and his team came and asked, 
what is it, what do you want this employment center to look like? And they believed that they would be listened to. They picked the colors, they picked the services, they picked all of those things. And over a hundred people in Park Edge, Park Ridge showed up every time that we had a community meeting because they were invested, they felt that they were listened to, and the Employment and Training Center as it is, too small, it was the result of the community saying, this is what we want. And so I would say to, to colleagues, and I almost didn't speak as I, but, but I need to say this, and however you vote is how you vote. If the people who will be occupying the space has said very clearly, this is what we need. If the planning staff has said that we listen to the people and this is the, this is the concept that we're coming up with, why are we saying, well, that sounds good, but we wanna put it, we wanna build more, we wanna expand it, we wanna do this, we wanna do that. So let's really start listening to the people. Alder, you've muted yourself again. Thank you. I'm in. I'm, I'm complete. Alder Heck? Connection. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mayor, I think you disappeared briefly. Um, I have an amendment to offer, and if that's appropriate at this time. Uh, Alder, just to clarify, is it an amendment to the amendment that's before us, or is it a, it's an, an amendment to the amendment that's before us? I believe that is in order. I don't think we can get any farther than that, though, so let, let's try it. All right, uh, I'll offer that, and if I get a second, I'll explain. Um, I'd like to uh, change the uh, amendment to only deal with the future land use map, yet retain the original uh, concept map that's in the plan. Uh, is there a second? Alder Furman, is that a second? Yes, so moved by Alder Heck, seconded by Alder Furman. Um, and perhaps, uh, Director Stouter, you would do us the favor of bringing back the slides so that we can refer to them and make sure that everybody understands what Alder Heck is proposing. Okay, thank you, Heather. Uh, what I'm proposing is that uh, the future land use map change from the version that's on the left, which is what is currently in the draft plan and, and changing it to low medium residential throughout the entire Thorstead area. And as we just, uh, as we discussed earlier, that would allow uh, more density uh, than if it were uh, just low residential is on the left. And, and certainly Heather can add more if, if that's appropriate. Thank you, Alder Heck. I, I do think it's um, appropriate to see if staff wants to add anything and then if we have any questions for staff. Sorry, I couldn't find my unmute button with the screen share. Shall I share that again? Uh, up, up to you, Heather. Did you want to, uh, did you or Jeff want to add anything to clarify Alder Heck's amendment? Um, my understanding of it is that this this then would be the change would be basically from this light yellow to the the darker shade of yellow or the low medium residential. So that would be changing the majority of the Thorstead site from up to sixteen units per acre, um, raising that to a, a range up to thirty units per acre, allowing again for a mix of housing types to include. Um, anything ranging from single family to uh, small multifamily. Thank there, you. Thank you. Are there any questions about the what the amendment is or its implications? Alder Curry? 
I'm sorry, it may be the late hour, but how is that different than Alder Evers? I'm thoroughly confused. I can answer. Uh, I'm all I'm doing is uh, changing the future land use map rather than both changing both the future land use map and the concept. Uh, that that second concept that Alder Evers was proposing um, that uh, shrank the size of the single family lots would no no longer be uh, in play if this amendment were to pass. So the, the concept map would be as it was originally presented, yet the land use recommendation uh, would change. And I can explain uh, if, if that makes sense. I can explain my motivation. Uh, I think that's a request for you to explain. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I offered an, an, a successful amendment at Plan Commission that was a text amendment that essentially said, in this implement plans implementation, we should allow for flexibility in terms of density and the forms of buildings. But after after the question, a couple of questions that I asked tonight, uh, I heard uh, of staff. I heard that the boundary between uh, low residential future land use map, which is uh, what's currently in the draft plan, and low medium, which is uh, in Alder Evers amendment and, and what I'm proposing, it's, it's a little bit firm, not, not entirely. So plan commission has a little less discretion to exercise when development proposals come forward. Uh, and, and so uh, if something that was, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing, but it, let's say that a proposal came forward that was about 25 dwelling units per acre instead of 15, it's it's a little less likely that plan commission would say, ah, we still think that's reasonable and we're going to go for it. They it's more likely they could say, we don't really think that meets the future land use recommendation. So uh, I think what my amendment will do is give additional flexibility to plan commission and staff as they consider future development. Yet it still retains the original uh, concept map, and and that is you know, I think has been vetted more by the community. And so the goal is still the, can the, the, the concept map that was originally presented rather than the one that Alder Evers was proposing, but it just gives more flexibility. So I think what I'm doing is extending what I did at plan commission with my text amendment to changing the future land use map to give staff and plan commission more flexibility as, as in the future, as uh, proposals come forward, whether it's through uh, city-owned land or city financing or even private developers, there'll be more flexibility again. So that's what my amendment is all about, if that makes sense. Thank you, Alder. Is there discussion of the HEC amendment? Alder Bennett. I don't, I mean, I, I, this, I don't want to ask a question directly to Patrick because I know that's not allowed, but I'm asking. It, it, Alder, you can, you can ask your question of Alder Heck. Okay. Uh, it is up to him if he would like to respond. Okay. Okay. So um, I understand that this will allow more flexibility. However, I am still like trying to understand how that would make a difference. Because I is this this is assuming like developers will be private developers will be developing this or because as director starter stated um, this would this is going to be largely a city development plan so whatever plan that we adopt now is what the city is going to be mo moving forward in I I hope I understand I know <laughs> I'm so confused. Oh. I, I'm willing to answer. Go ahead. Thank you, Alder Bennett, for the question. Um, I, I'm not assuming that private developers will be who develops this. It, the city and private developers have to follow the future land use map. And uh, the concepts will influence how either a private development or a city development uh, were to move forward. The, 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 uh, 
the plan, the South Madison plan guides either kind of development. Uh, and so uh, that that's why I think that this will still uh, achieve, I think, uh, some flexibility and honor the original plan at the same time. But uh, I, I think we, we all recognize that the concepts are just concepts. And the bigger issue is really additional flexibility in my mind. Alder Foster? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I agree that the future land use map uh, update to, to allow for that flexibility is really the, the critical element. Um, you know, we've heard over and over tonight, you know, the concept's just a concept, it really doesn't matter. And then we're spending like hours arguing about what the concept is that apparently everybody agrees doesn't matter. And where I, I mean, I think it does matter a bit. And I think actually, in particular, probably matters more to the degree that the city is involved. And, um, you know, it is the thing that people look at. And so, you know, what, what Elder Evers put forward is, is really real, relatively minor adjustments that just moves it a little bit closer to the kind of density that we, I think, should expect at a really high capacity transit stop. And so for, you know, the, the Common Council or the Plan Commission, 15 years from now or 20 years from now that's wrestling with this concept, I would prefer that their starting point with that concept is one that's at least a little bit closer to the kind of density that I think is really needed for a sustainable city. So I, I'm going to vote no against this, although I appreciate the intent. Thank you, Alder. I have no other Alders in the queue. Uh, so just to clarify what we're voting on, um, this is uh, if if you vote I, you're saying that you want to change uh, Alder Evers' amendment to only impact the uh, future land use map um, and to not impact the, the Thorstead concept. If you vote no, you're saying that you want the amendments to continue to change both the future land use map and the Thorstead concept. Just making sure that everybody understands what the vote is. Um, Alder Carter. I'm just going to ask you to repeat that one more time for everyone. Absolutely, Alder. Uh, so firstly, we're voting to determine what the amendment is, and then we will vote on the amendment. That's thing one, okay? And so then thing two is, um, if you want the amendment to the plan to only change the future land use map, you should vote aye. If you want the amendment to the plan to change both the future land use map and the Thorstead concept, you should vote no. And so all those in Alder Curry. Can I ask a question? Yes, Alder. Um, I guess it's for Director Stouter or I'm sorry, I don't know your title, Greg. Um, Jeff. Jeff. Um, never mind, never mind. Okay, so uh, uh, Alder Figueroa call. Okay, so I'm just trying to follow the directive here. We voting yes or no for the, set, for the amendment to the amendment, but then we still have to vote for the amendment, right? Okay, because I, it sounded like like we voted right. no, and there's no men, no, you know, yes to the other one, but that's not what we're saying. Nope. But you're, we're saying. you're deciding whether you want to make two changes or one change, and then you will have to decide if you want to make any changes at all. Right, got it. That's what I thought. Okay, so all the way. Like. <laughs> I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. I'm a little bit confused. Can we go one? One at a time, perhaps say this is uh, Alder Hex's amendment and this is what it is. Let's vote on it. Take out of the way and then go to, if it fails, then we go to. That's whatever. what we're oh. doing, Alder. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Because I'm, I'm confused. Yep. So right now, you're, you're, you, will, you have not yet decided whether you want to amend the plan. We will vote on that in a minute. Right now, you're deciding. If 
the plan should be amended, how do you want to amend it? Right? And so one option is to make two changes, which is what Alder Evers is proposing. And another option is to make one change, which is what Alder Heck is proposing. If you want to make no changes to the plan, uh, perhaps you don't even care about the outcome of this vote. Um, so just saying. Um, but it, it, if you want fewer changes to the plan, you probably want to vote aye now. Right? So because an aye vote is to make one change, a no vote is to make two changes. But can I still vote no to both? Yes. Not in this vote, in the next vote. I'm I'm hoping for some confirmation that we understand here. Alder Curry? Okay, I feel remiss not asking this question. I, I feel my understanding is a lot of the density concerns and issues come from what is now the Thorstat site. Seeing that Alder Hex amendments allows for flexibility within that area and the zoning there, but within the whole plan, does that cause... Uh, the only changes that we're discussing now are, are on the Thorstad site. Now I'm more confused. <laughs> so there's there's two pieces in the plan, and and maybe Heather can bring back the slides to help show this. Um, and in in Alder Evers' amendment, he's recommending two changes, and the first change is what you're looking at now to the future land use map, right? And it's the question of um, what density range. Right. The second change is to what you're looking at now, which is the focus area concept. Right. And so you're 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 basically this is what Alder Evers would want, what's before you right now. Um, what was just previously up was the original plan. Right. And so those those are the two changes that are being proposed. Right. So if you if if a no vote prevails on what's immediately before us. This concept would not change from what's currently in the the plan that staff proposed. It, the only thing that would change would be the future land use map. If an uh, sorry, that's a, if an I vote prevails. If a um, no vote prevails, both changes would happen. But but you still sorry, you still have to vote on whether you want to make the change or not. Right, so there's there's two votes. Alder Bennett? And I don't know if this is a thing, but um, could we vote on Alder Evers alternate and then Alder Hex um, amendment? No, okay, that's not a thing, never mind. It's not a, it's not a thing, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. So all those in favor of changing only the future land use map, vote aye. All those in favor of having the amendment stay as changing the future land use map and the Thorstead concept, vote no. As your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Alder Halverson? No. No. Alder Harrington McKinney? Aye. Aye. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Alder Limmer? Aye. Aye. Vice President Martin? Aye. Aye. Alder Mayadzi? Aye. Aye. Alder Revere? Aye. Aye. Alder Vitavir? Aye. Aye. Alder Wahili? Aye. Aye. President Abbas? Aye. Aye. 
Alder Alboras is absent. Alder, Alder Benford? Aye. Aye. Alder Bennett? I'm back. I apologize. Alder Bennett? Come back to me, please. Okay. Alder Carter? Aye. Aye. Alder Conklin? Aye. Aye. Alder Curry? Aye. Aye. Alder Evers? No. No. Alder Figaro Cole? Aye. Alder Figaro Cole? Aye. Can you hear me? I, I can now. Okay, so that will be a yes, please. Thank you. Aye. Alder Foster? No for me. No. Alder Furman? Aye. Aye. And Alder Bennett? No. No. Madam Mayor, I have 15 ayes and four no's. Thank you. So with 15 ayes, the amendment prevails. And now what's before us um, is to vote whether or not we want to amend the plan with this change, right? So it's the single change to the future land use map to uh, allow a slightly greater density on the Thorstead property. That's the only change we're voting on at this point in time. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just guess that we need to do a roll call. Um, Alder Bennett. This is as amended by Alder Hex amended. Correct. Okay. Correct. So the, what we're voting on now is whether you want to change the plan with Alder Hex amendment which is to change only the future land use map. So all those in favor of changing the plan to changing the future land use map for the Thorstead area in the final plan, aye. Those opposed, no. Uh, is there an objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor? Yes. Uh, so we will do a roll call then. Uh, all those in favor of amending the plan, aye. Those opposed, no, as your name is called, and the clerk will call the roll, please. Alder Halverson? No. No. Alder Harrington McKinney? Yes. Aye. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Alder Limmer? No. No. Vice President Martin? Aye. Aye. Alder Mayadze? No. No. Alder Revere? Aye. Aye. Alder Vitavir? Aye. Aye. Alder Wahelie? Aye. Aye. President Abbas? Aye. Aye. Alder Aboras is absent. Alder Benford? We can't hear you, Alder Benford. Aye. Aye. Alder Bennett? Aye. Aye. Alder Carter? Come back to me, please. Alder Conklin? Aye. Aye. Alder Curry? Aye. I apologize, I didn't catch that. Yes. Aye. Alder Evers? Aye. Aye. Alder Figueroa Cole? Aye. Aye. Alder Foster? Aye. Aye. Alder Furman? Aye. Aye. And Alder Carter? Aye. Aye.
Madam Mayor. I have 16 ayes and three noes. The 16 ayes, the amendment passes, and we're back to the main motion, which is to adopt the plan as amended. Is there further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, is there any objection to me making a remark or two from the chair? Seeing no objection, I just want to say thank you to our planning staff for the incredible amount of work that they put into this planning process. Um, I pushed them rather hard on this one, uh, particularly with respect to engagement um, and you know, really listening to the community and, and taking them seriously and finding new ways to engage and um, challenging them around the questions of uh, you know, being honest about what we would be able to deliver as a city um, in a plan. And uh, they really stepped up and I think did a really remarkably good job at putting this plan together, um, not just in terms of the outcome, the actual plan document, um, but even more so in terms of the process that they went through to get to it. Um, and so I just really want to say a, a huge public thank you to Director Stouter and to all of her staff that worked on this plan um, for the work that they did getting us to this point. Um, so thank you. Um, and unless there is further discussion, is there any objection um, to recording a unanimous vote in favor of adopting the South Madison plan? President Abbas? I'm confused. Uh, what main motion was as amended by Alder Hack, and we have a roll call vote, right? And now you're saying there's a, another motion for unanimous consent? We're, we we're voting now to adopt the plan. But I thought we already adopted as amended by Alder Hack. No, we, we amended the... So Alder Evers made an amendment. Mm -hmm. Alder Hack proposed an amendment to that amendment. That's right. We accepted that on a roll call vote. And then we had a roll call vote on whether we wanted to amend the plan. That's the roll call vote we just had. That mm -hmm. passed. Now we're back to the main motion of do we want to adopt the amended plan? Perfect. Yep. So it is getting late. That's all right. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that as not an objection from President Abbas, but Alder Miyadze. Alder, you're muted. Sorry about that. I was a little bit confused myself. I wanted to vote yes for the original motion and um, and not to the other. Um, well, you know what I mean. You I wanted to <laughs> vote against amending the plan. I I I just want the original motion that was uh, for uh, without all, all the amendments. So I I don't know what the so I was a little bit confused. So hopefully you guys understand what I was trying to do. I, I think I do, Alder, and unless there's an objection, um, we'll have the clerk uh, record you as voting no on that last roll call, which okay. would change the count to four no's. Okay. All right. Doesn't, doesn't change the outcome, but we'll record you as, as having that sentiment. There any further clarifications or discussion on the motion to adopt the South Madison plan as amended? Alder Wahilahe. I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. So just to be clear, what we have adopted and voted is Alder Hex's amendment. Yes, that we have, a, we have made that change to the plan. Now we are voting on adopt or passing the plan as amended. So all the evers is not in 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 in, in the plan. Okay. Uh, the the change to the concept, the Thorstead concept is not in the plan at this point. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Everybody else good? Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of the South Madison plan as amended by Alder Hack? Seeing no objection, that plan is adopted. And congratulations to Jeff and the rest of the staff team for dragging it across the finish line. All right, 
We do uh, still have two items before us. It's been suggested to me that someone might want to make a motion for a brief recess. Alder Vitiver, is that a, a motion for a five-minute recess? Yes, five minutes, please. All right, and Alder Wahili will second. Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of a five-minute recess? Seeing no objection, it's 11 p.m. now. We'll be back at 11.05. We're at 11.05, uh, but because 
Um, it turned to 1101 right after I finished speaking. I'll give people a little grace <laughs> coming back. But when you're back, uh, please do bring your camera back on. All right, now it's 11.06, so we'll come back and I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Alder Halverson. Present. Alder Harrington McKinney. Present. Alder Heck. Here. Alder Limmer. Here. Vice President Martin. Uh, we'll come back. Alder Mayanzi. Present. Alder Revere. Here. Alder Vitavir. Here. Alder Wahelier. Here. President Abbas. Here. Alder Aboras absent. Alder Benford. Present. Alder Bennett. Uh, we'll come back. Alder Carter. Present. Alder Conklin. Here. Alder Curry. Alder Evers. Here. Alder Figueroa Cole. Here. Alder Foster. Here. Alder Furman. Present. Vice President Martin. Here. Alder Bennett. Here. And Madam Mayor, we have quorum. Thank you. Um, we are now on item 61, which is Legistar 66949, amending sections of the Mad Madison General Ordinances to revise the jurisdiction of the Common Council Executive Committee. Um, I'll remind you that uh, of the history here uh, at the 1019 meeting last year, the motion to adopt failed on a vote of 9-9. Nine -nine. Um, reconsideration was requested uh, at our November 2nd meeting. Uh, reconsideration was uh, approved and discussion was referred to this meeting. So um, the I believe um, the appropriate motion is to adopt and we'll go from there, but I'll just note that we had two registrants on this item, Justice Castaneda of District 15 in support available to answer questions and Janet Hirsch of District 9 in opposition, not wishing to speak. Are there any questions for a registrants? Seeing none, President Abbas, a motion, please. Motion to adopt. Second. It's moved and seconded to adopt. Is there discussion? Uh, actually, before we move into discussion, um, because it wouldn't be a council meeting without this, my computer is going to restart. Uh, and so I will call on Alder Furman and President Abbas. I will hand the chair over to you. I will restart and be right back. So Alder Furman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'd like to propose an amendment, um, which is would to be ad added the following text to this um, ordinance, which would be uh, this ordinance shall be effective on April 19th, 2020. Um, if I get a second, I will explain my amendment. You mean 
April 19, 2022. You said 2020. Sorry, 2022. That's correct, Council President. My apologies. All right. Alder Heck, that second from you. Okay. Um, th thank you, Alder Heck, for the second. Um, thank you, Council President. Um, I'm proposing this amendment um, uh, at this point um, as a uh, uh, a way to hopefully get this item passed. Um, I think I've uh, uh, explained my intent. Um, I think some people um, uh, believe I was uh, targeting um, the, the current CCEC, um, which um, I still don't understand because I've agreed to, with just about all, all of their votes. Um, but I think at this point, um, I, I believe very strongly in this um, change uh, for CCEC, both for the, the function of this body, um, as well as um, public, um, and think that this, um, having this effective uh, with new leadership um, in April um, is just the right move forward at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo Furman. Any further comments? I do not see any hand raise and I will speak. Uh, Thank you very much. I appreciate the amendment. Uh, try to take the personal sector out of it. However, I will express uh, some of the concerns with it. And I think so it's important for us as a body to think about the future of CCEC as well. I'm, sure Bob, I'm sorry, before you start, can I just ask for Alder Furman to repeat what the amendment is? Oh, Alder Furman amendment is just sure. the Go ahead, uh, President, go ahead, sorry. It will be adopted, uh, the date, if it's this past, this will be adopted on April 19th, I believe, 2022. Thank you, sorry for the interruption. No worries. Yeah, so uh, Alder Bavir and also Alder Benford, they have a longer institutional history, especially Alder Babir is uh, here for a long period of time. And during time of Alder Benford, I believe the CCEC was more an uh, admin role. They play an administrative role. I forget the name of CCEC. And that time the council decided to change the role of the CCEC and in more leadership and discussing about the key issues City of Medicine faces, especially those issues which, uh, which doesn't have any place to go on the committees. Also, key important issues where council have uh, major difference of opinions, or I will say conflicts, where eight alders and we as we could discuss those topics, create consensus and move forward. Taking CCAC's power, making it more administrative uh, branch, looking into administrative work is a one step backward rather than forward. I really hoped my colleague uh, give some time instead of making this amendment and changing the, the scope of CCEC, perhaps we could have that more discussion on within a CCEC and then decide in which direction we all want to go. Rather, we really truly want this to be administrative body or do we want beside administrative body, we want to look into policies related to CNs. As an example, uh, let's say if the issue of uh, violence prevention have no place in any, any committees, that could be discussed at CCEC. Uh, I will give you a couple of other examples. I, my, under my leadership, I tried my best in all good honesty to balance the CCEC. I presented a resolution to, to set the criteria for homeless shelter that failed at CCEC. I did not debate it that on a common council floor. So the role of CCEC where we could discuss as a policymaker where and how the shelter issue was very, uh, how I say, uh, there was a lot of difference of opinion on there. How, how could we move forward? And the role of CCEC was also keen for the community to come and listen and have that discussion as well as from us as a council policymaker to decide on the high level topics, how we have to move forward. Another thing I want to say as a caution to our colleagues moving forward, if we decided to move out this role of CCEC as a refer and just create it as an administrative body, 
tomorrow uh, several issues, let's say uh, emergency plan, which was referred to CCEC by me because I do believe that is a place to be discussed. Any alder can make a motion and move it to a, you know, let's say, police and fire commission. I'm just giving an example or any other, uh, I mean, PSCR or any other committees and just make CCC irrelevant. Uh, also, I will say, beside those, all those things, this whole debate around referrals and, and the, the main sponsor email to all alders about how this homelessness issue and body-worn camera issue and all that stuff come to committees, it's wastage of time, or you know, there are other committees, that's their role to discuss. I respect your all of your opinions regarding our committee structure. And I do understand sometimes we refer to many places, but why we are cherry picking one CCEC rather than looking into all others committees as well and see how the other committees are working. Uh, DFOX recommendation was to look into all the structure of our BCCs, but here we are discussing one committee. And that's, that's also, I, I personally, I know, uh, uh, my fellow alder said uh, there was no attack or intention was not attacked. But I personally felt like when there is always people of color in a leadership role, either it's Alder Carter or Alder Balde, and these are the alders which I watched those meetings and part of the Common Council and myself, there's always this type of policy comes forward and undermining the role of the council leadership or undermining the role of the minority leaders who want to lead the community or lead the council Rather, I prefer we have a role of collaboration or discussion. Alder Foster ordinance, which council approved and, and we are following those referral process, that basically address most of those concerns about referral. And let me remind this council as well. Alder Heverson, many of his referrals was challenged on this float on council, and it did not went to various committees. Council still have this power to decide if they want those referrals or not. Removing those referrals completely from CCEC is truly a step backward. If the intention is to give CCC more time, making it more robust, those are discussions should happen on CCEC floor within a committee, those eight elected official, rather than making a legislative decisions and decide what should be the faith of CCEC. I'm just very disappointed the way this whole uh, politics, you say politics, or however you say, this is happening around uh, CCEC and council leadership. I will encourage it to completely vote against it and let's retable it to have a discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have that discussion. And, and perhaps if the intention is next council leadership, they could have that uh, discussion and then decide either they really want to change the role of the CCEC or not. Thanks. Thank you, President Abbas. Just to confirm, we're on uh, the amendment offered by Alder Furman um, to add language around the effective date uh, being April 19th of this year. Yes, okay. Uh, so on the question of the effective date, Alder Figueroa Cole, you're muted, Alder. Thank you. So just a, as a, a, me and my process questions, because I want to make sure I got this right. I mean, we have discussed this topic for a long time already. So is the, is is this a place for me to call a question and just go to a vote? Is that an, an opportunity for us to go ahead and do that? Alder, if you call the question now, you're calling the question on um, Alder Furman's amendment. Okay. And then we have to vote on the other on the other one. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll wait. But I mean, again, we had just like discussed this, and I what I heard we already heard before. So. I'm a little bit disappointed about that, to be honest, to hear the same rhetoric. So, yes, I'll, I'll wait until the next turn. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Alder. Alder Carter, on the question of the effective date? Yes, I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Carter. Are there is there a further discussion on the question of uh, Alder Furman's amendment on the effective date? All right, seeing none. 
Is there any objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of adding language around an effective date of April 19th, 2022, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, and I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Alder Halverson? No. No. Alder Harrington McKinney? No. No. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Alder Limmer? Aye. Aye. Vice President Martin? Aye. Aye. Alder Mayadze? No. No. Alder Revere? Aye. Aye. Alder Vitavere? Aye. Aye. Alder Wahelier? No. No. President Abbas? No. No. Alder Aboris is absent. Alder Benford? Aye. Aye. Alder Bennett? Uh, aye. Aye. Alder Carter? No. No. Alder Conklin? Aye. Aye. Alder Curry? Aye. Aye. Alder Evers? Aye. Aye. Alder Figueroa Cole? Aye. Aye. Alder Foster? Aye. Aye. Alder Furman? Aye. Aye. Madam Mayor, I have 13 ayes and six noes. Thank you. With 13 ayes, the amendment passes. We're now back to the main motion, uh, which is uh, adopting uh, as amended. Uh, discussion on that, Alder Halverson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would just say with regards to this, we have, we have been around this, and I know that uh, I'm going to take a vote on this, but I would just say if you look at uh, number one, where it says that uh, you're basically saying that they are not anything that's not referred to other committees. If you put any other committee into this um, sentence, it, it doesn't make any sense. And so I think if the purpose is to um, not have have things that are only structural administration, then you should just abolish this this committee altogether and just get an administrative committee. Or heck, we could have we could actually just have our function discussions on the floor here. Um, so I will not be supporting this. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, if you want to get rid of it, we should get rid of it. Thank you, Alder, Alder Figueroa Cole. Right, so I'd like to call the question, please, and go to a vote. Alder, conveniently, there's no other Alders in the queue at this time. Thank you. So uh, oh, there is now one other Alder in the queue, Alder Harrington McKinney. So, Madam Mayor, are, will this go into um, discussion on we're, the amendment? We're in discussion now on the main motion, Alder. Okay, and so if that this uh, passes, then it'll be a yay or nay? No, this, this is the yay or nay on the question. The amendment passed. We're now back to the main motion, whether you want to um, amend the jurisdiction of CCEC. Okay, please help me. I'm really being slow tonight. Is this that at what point is there discussion? Are we in discussion now? Yes. Okay, all right. And I have discussion then. Go ahead, Alder. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I am, uh, I will not. Mayor, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, but there's a motion to call the question. Um, uh, it, is that Alder, it, it, it's not debatable. If the Alder wishes to bring that motion forward, it was it was moot at the time she made it because there is no other Alders in the queue. It is no longer moot. Is there a second to call the question? Yes. All right. So it's been moved and seconded to call the question. Is there objection to calling the question? Yes. Uh, uh, so then uh, all those in favor of calling the question, aye. Those opposed, no. As your name is called, then the clerk will please call the roll. Alder Halverson? No. No. Alder Harrington McKinney? 
No. No. Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Alder Limmer? Aye. Aye. Vice President Martin? Aye. Aye. Alder Mayadze? No. No. Alder Revere? No. No. Alder Vitavir? Aye. Aye. Alder Wahilie? No. No. President Abbas? No. No. Alder Boris is absent. Alder Benford? No. No. Alder Bennett? Aye. Aye. Alder Carter? No. No. Alder Conklin? Aye. Aye. Alder Curry? Aye. Aye. Alder Evers? Aye. Aye. Alder Figueroa Cole? Aye. Aye. Alder Foster? Aye. Aye. Alder Furman? Aye. Aye. Madam Mayor, I have 11 ayes and eight noes. With 11 ayes, the motion to call the question passes. The question is called. We'll move directly to a vote. Uh, Attorney Haas wants to contradict me. Well, uh, <laughs> it's a two-thirds vote, isn't right. it? Yes. Damn it. I always forget that one. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry. It's a good thing we have you here, Attorney Haas. Uh, so you. my apologies to the body. Um, but calling the question requires a two-thirds vote. 11 votes does not make the two-thirds threshold. The question is not called. We are back to discussion of the main motion. And in the queue was Alder Harrington McKinney. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, let me start. Um, um, this item was a very challenging um, uh, for me. And um, the reason is, is that, um, and, and I'll just go through my notes. Um, the ordinance says receive referrals of ordinances, uh, resolutions, and reports from the Common Council that are not referred to other committees. Um, two, three, and four in that section really challenged me. Um, discuss, develop, and recommend to the council in dialogues with interested parties a work plan for council action during the next year and track the plan as approved by the council. I know that that was struck through, and I'm glad that it was. Um, it raised a few questions uh, for me. Is, is that... Um, who would hold the committees accountable? Um, constituents that elected the 20 alders. The 20 alders select or elects the president and vice president of the executive committee. The other members of the executive committee are selected from the, 20, the 18 other alders. Will the committees have independent authority to make decisions? The committee members are appointed by the city mayor. The chair of these committees are also appointed by the city, city, uh, city, city mayor. We have said that the boards, committees, and commissions are not equally vet. We have some strong, very strong chairs and committees that are actionable, and we've got some committees that are not, and they really need to be sunset. The, the, the problem that I have with this is, is that boards, committee, members of board committees and commissions are not elected by um, the, the constituent. They are not. They're not accountable, and who are they accountable for, uh, or to? And so my, my uncomfortableness is that you, you have an executive committee, and I've been on the council since 2015, 
some of the resolutions and some of the actions uh, and amendments that are very strong or created by the executive committee. The executive committee have gone through um, some very um, 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 uh, really poignant, uh, very decisive challenges in the council and they have done an excellent job so far. And so I'm really baffled as to why uh, this amendment is coming forward to take those, those some of those, uh, and I'm gonna say powers from the executive committee and place it to boards, committees and commissions when it's been said over and over again that the boards, committees and commissions um, needs additional training. I don't think that uh, the boards, committees, and commission should be the only source of referrals. If, if you don't want an executive committee, just do away with it altogether and not have an executive committee and let everything rest and go through the council to make those decisions. And if the council is not making those decisions, send it to the committees. I don't think that this is something that um, we want to do going forward. I'm very surprised that, um, and, and no, I'm not surprised, I mean, let me take that back, is, is that um, how we're looking at the council now in this virtual world is not the council that I think that would be approving some of the things that the executive committee should be grappling with. So I'm not going to support it. Uh, whether it passes or not, I think it's the wrong movement and the direction for an executive committee. The executive committee should have the opportunity to not just um, uh, receive, they should receive information that's referred to them uh, and not just um, to send that or uh, whatever information over to boards, committees, and commissions to have that authority, especially and they're not equally matched. Uh, one of the reasons that I voted against the amendment uh, tonight is that we have an overflux of boards, commissions, and committees. And I've sat in on some boards, committees, and commissions where the chair and the members of the committee were just so uh, attuned and so informed and so efficient to handle the business of the council, but I've sat on some boards, committees, and commissions when they can rep repeatedly ask, what am I supposed to do? What am I task? And all of those. And so there's a lot of work to be done in strengthening boards, commissions, and committees. And I don't think that that work is being done. And I think that uh, stripping, and I'm gonna say stripping the uh, executive committee of some of those responsibilities does not does not address what is the real issue in strengthening the boards, committees, and commissions. And so I will not be supporting um, the um, uh, 61649. Thank you, Alder. On the question of adoption, Alder Carter. I will not be supporting this either. And in fact, I agree with Alder uh, Harvelson and, and McKinney. Uh, the next step should be to sunset CCEC because essentially that's what you're doing. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't put icing on the cake. That's exactly what you're doing. And you are diminishing the power of your executive committee. For those of you who are new and might not understand the, the importance of the executive committee, then let's sunset it. We talk about sunsetting BCCs all the time. You can start with this. And uh, that would be my friendly amendment if this is the appropriate time to do amendment. But I, I depend on the mayor for uh, keeping me on the right road. Alder, there's no such thing as a friendly amendment. Um, if, you, if you honestly 
wish to make an amendment, that is the appropriate, now is the appropriate time to do it. I move in and I will move in it for amendment, not a friendly one. I will move an amendment that in light of the um Alder Cutter, let me pause you right there because it, it you you really do need to put it into writing and, and oh, share it okay. with your colleagues and the clerk if you wish to move an amendment. Well, I'll okay. come back to you. I will do that. Come back to me. Thank you, Alder. Alder Hilahe on the question of adoption. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, and I know many times and many meetings, many things have been said, and I'm going to, I'm not going to repeat what has been said, but I want to reiterate two points. One point is this is power and privilege at this point. Uh, we talked about so many referrals. And if you look at the, uh, this, this, the history of this particular item, it was referred many times because we didn't have, we, we, we are trying to change the vote of those who voted no. Uh, an example is when we adapted or when the motion failed in October 19th. Let me just check my... What is it? Here it is, yes. So the item was introduced and it came to the Common Council and it was decided to put in uh, uh, on file without prejudice. And it was brought again and it was said that it should come to this, uh, the Common Council October 19th. It failed. And then it because it did not have some of the elders who were not there, they were asked to reconsider it. And when they reconsider, then there were three people who were absent. And then it was referred to the other meetings. So if we are talking about CCC, it's a place for so many referrals, then we have to talk about the power and privilege. Who is in power? Who can make those changes? And why not other people cannot make these changes? Because we are changing the vote, we don't have enough vote, so let's refer it to another time or another date. And this is what we are coming. Like other, my colleagues said, if we are undermining the leadership of the CCC or the function of the CCC, then we should sunset. We don't need to have a body that don't have any any power or any activities that can empower as an executive body. Uh, executive body is a place where we can make decisions, but also we can discuss other important things about the Common Council. So with that, I will not be voting. And the amendment that was made tonight is just a sugar code, not to feel like it's a retaliation of Alder Abbas. Uh, either way, whoever's going to be the president of the Common Council, President Abbas has three more months, January, February, and March. But this is the protection of the body as the CCC, as an executive body. And like Alder Carter said, for those of us who are new, we don't understand or know the history of the CCC and its importance. At some day and some long term in the future, we'll realize that this was a very bad move. And I will urge you not to vote for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miadze and the question of adoption. Uh, I think, Alder, I think my, colleague, my colleague said it best, so I'm not going to add to it. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Alder. Um, Alder Carter, I don't know that I've gotten an email from you, but did you? Oh, well. We'll go to Alder Bennett. Let me keep this real brief um, because I know a lot has been said. So I just wanted to say that I think that I don't think I know this argument that we need to completely strip CCC or let it go 
all together is a, it's a fallacy and it's a false dilemma fallacy, which presents two extremes. Um, we're not going to the extreme that CCC completely needs to go away. Just that it needs to be refocused. So that's where I'm at. And I, I wish that new arguments were presented today that were better than a fallacy. Thank you, Alder Bennett. Alder Figueroa Cole. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, I mean, again, call the question because we have had this discussion plenty and I haven't heard anything, absolutely anything new um, on the topic. So. I just don't see why we can vote on it. However, um, I I don't even want to say I'm disappointed because I'm just I, there's just not even measure for that anymore. I, I it, it's not about that. It's just I'm annoyed to just to be totally honest that we continue to use these the race card to uh, to deal with this particular issue. It's really it is disturbing to me that we continue to attack, um, to use the pretenses or to, to, to pretend that you know how somebody else is feeling um, towards you. If you really like, I mean, I know that people involved in this discussion, you know who you are. I have emailed you together as a group. I have asked you if you really feel threatened, if you really feel like someone um, in a position of power because of their, their skin color is coming after you because you are a brown person or because you're a woman, please, you, we are all adults here. Nobody is um, putting a gun to your, head and, to your head and say, shut up and don't defend your rights. If you really, really, really feel that that's the way certain members are treating you, please address it. If you need help, we have help that can help you with that. Mayor, I, 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 Mayor, I, I'm sorry, but how do you object to when somebody's saying something that you Alder, think it's... It, you, it, I call the question and... and you, uh, you Alder, you, first of all, it, I, we will have order. Yeah, but I've You heard cannot the, all just start speaking. Until okay. I call on you, please remain silent unless you have an appropriate motion to make. All right. I'm sorry. Alder Figueroa Cole, you you can't both call the question and speak to it. No, that's I, that's what I mean. So I call the question, but we want to talk. So let's talk again. We are there's nothing new here, nothing new that, that has presented tonight that we haven't discussed already. So if you guys want honesty and this other talk about us that the new people don't understand what we're doing, how many times are you going to use that line? <laughs> For the love of God, like come on, guys. If you want it honesty, let's be honest. This is just about personal problems that continue to, to come in council. And we keep on talking about how, you know, earlier people speaking about how, how um, this is in a virtual world that this happens. Like this is going to change when we go in person. These are personal differences between a handful of people. And for some reason, there's this, this um, lack of interest to solve them on a private mode. That's that's all is happening here. And again, I try via email to communicate to that handful of people. I, I try to really make the connection and see if we can work these things out, but nothing nothing came out of it. So let's just take the vote, please. That's all I'm asking. If, if we want to talk about honesty, let's just be honest. There's nothing here but personal issues. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. I'm going to remind us all, please, to, to firstly, to address your colleagues by their titles and with respect. And secondly, to try and keep things in the realm of policy. That's the business that we're here to do. I know on this particular topic, this body has repeatedly failed to keep the conversation in the realm of policy. Uh, I would just encourage us all again to try and do that. Alder Harrington McKinney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, some of the issues that have come before previous um, executive committee 
One is the role of the, the chief of staff and the duties of the chief of staff and the hiring and selection of the first chief of staff. That was done out of executive committee. Um, the OI, OIR report was generated out of an executive committee workings. Uh, the civilian oversight committee was a result of work out of the uh, executive committee. The, com the executive committee has tackled some, some critical areas that, you, that many of us are voting on now and coming into flourishing. Um, it, it was said, and I'm just going to go there and I'm going to try to be as gentle as I can, uh, uh, the playing of the race card. Um, and when you say that, that's offensive to me because what, what, what I'm hearing is the playing of the race card, but the term that is used is equitable and diversity. And so that's a substitute for that word. Um, it is, whether you know it or not, but I'm just going to own it because I know it to be a fact. Um, I have sat under uh, the leadership of some presidents and vice presidents of the executive committee, and they were ill-equipped. They were absolutely not prepared for the position. But what happened, they had such strong other members on that body that came together and supported those uh, those presidents um, and to help them to move through that leadership. It is a fact when there is a, uh, it, prior to this, let me just say prior to this, when a person of color assumes the position of leadership, there is, has been historically pushback in that position. It does, has not happened in other situations, but historically, and it is evident and it is documented by those who it has in, impacted that when there is a person of color in leadership, then we get all of this pushback. It is privilege. When I was vice president, it was, it was privilege and I felt it there. And so, so I'm not playing the race card. I'm just calling it what it is. And in this particular incident, the executive committee has been very, very, very instrumental in moving legislation that we are now voting on, and that's a reality. They did that work within the confines of the executive committee, brought that work back to the council. The council looked at it and said, yay or nay, and sent it back and they worked back and forth. But the end result is some of the primary legislation that you are facing or that, that is in effect now came out of the executive committee. And so what, what my challenge is, is that it feels as though you're taking out the teeth. I'm, I'm not gonna be on the executive committee. I'm on the executive committee now. But there was a time, this is the first, only two times that I've served on the executive committee because the, the door was closed. There was just no entryway into um, uh, being on the executive committee. But, uh, you know, this back and forth, this is what we're looking at in terms of making a decision today in 2022 that will impact the incoming um, administrative, um, uh, the, the leadership of the council. That's what we're impacting. And so if we need to fine tune it, if we need to do what, whatever we need to do, but this absolutely negates the, um, the, uh, the executive committee and the functionality of the, of the executive committee. And I said is that it is the legislative arm. We've got the, the mayor, the mayor's deputy, and that's a functioning um, uh, arm uh, on the mayor's side. The executive committee is the functioning arm of the elected officials. And by taking that away, to me, it just seems as though maybe we just don't even need to have an executive committee, just sunset it. And then 
all of the discuss decisions can either go to a committee, board, or commission, or be housed on the council floor. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Harrington McKinney. Alder Wahila. Madam Mayor, I just want to apologize for uh, speaking without you calling me. So I just want to apologize. But what I want to say already, Alder McKinney have said, but I want to add one more thing, which is we're making decisions based on uh, personality, not on policy. Uh, and what has happened through this um, resolution has really, really created a toxic environment at the council. Uh, we have people who have different lived experience with different background. And if someone is privileged because of their background or their identity, then they, they have the right to do so. But you don't gaslight other people and say, give me a break, you know, why is this? You, you can't gaslight someone's feelings. You can't gaslight and disregard what someone is feeling. All we have said and, you know, mm -hmm. what we explained is there was a process. The process was not done. And if I have to repeat every time this item is brought forward, I will repeat. Even if you don't want to hear it, that's fine. But I am entitled to my feelings and I am entitled to my expression. And my expression is this whole thing was not followed the, the, the true process. Uh, if there was a change in the CCC, there's a president. The main first point of interaction was to have a conversation with the president of the uh, Common Council Executive Committee. If there is a change that needs to be done, the second place is the TFAG. We do not have that either. And we had numerous meetings and vote. And just because we want to change the way the vote, we wanted the vote to, to, to be acceptable or pleasant to us, then we're going to keep on referring. And that's the ultimate reason why we're changing this whole resolution so that we don't have resolution, I mean referral. How many referrals did we have? And I'm really disappointed with some of the elders when someone speaks, you don't speak for them. You don't speak for the experience. You don't speak for, for their frustrations. And I would really appreciate if someone refrained from saying such things. Someone said that I reach out to this, 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 this nonsense. No one reach out to individually, to me, and say, hey, Nasra, are you feeling this? How can I be support? What are you feeling about this? Maybe we can have a personal discussion. Let's do that. No one has ever done that. And for someone to make a false statement saying that they have reached out to these individuals, it's false, a false statement. And we're not here to lie, but we need to be honest and candid about how we interact with others and how we can be able to see each other's viewpoint rather than making a lot of assumptions. And I don't appreciate that. So Madam Mayor, I apologize for, for slash, just talking without your permission, but I want people to understand this is a process, not against the policy, but against personality. And if there's a personality differences, we could have voted on April, uh, October 19th. It failed. So let's move on. Why do we have to bring again? Because apparently it's the only people who want to talk and bring up is the people who are really talking the truth. But those people who are bringing back and forth and back and forth are not blamed for anything. They are the, they, they are the clean people that, oh, they're being attacked by the racial card or by this, this, this. And I think we are adults and we are here to think and analyze the facts. There was no process that was done. There is a policy that's disregarding the will of the executive body. 
and I'm not going to vote for that. Even if I have to bring again and again, I will bring it. But please don't insult my intelligence. And don't insult my intelligence by saying that I'm, only, I'm using the racial card. I am a black woman and I have my own experience. I have my own lived experience. And people need to understand that. Not to gaslight, oh, you know, people should not be using gas, you know, uh, racial card. You are, you know, there's a colorism. If you are a lighter person of color and you don't have that experience, that's fine. But don't insult our intelligence and our experience. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Alder. Alder Miyadze? I, too, wanted to apologize. Um, I meant to say point of order. Um, is that is that in a is that okay when if I was to uh, unmute myself and say point of order, is that is that okay or yes, Alder, that's that I, is absolutely just, um, an acceptable interruption. Um, it's okay. usually followed by a question. Okay, so sorry about that. I I was <laughs> I just couldn't find the words to actually say that. So I just wanted to apologize, and I wanted to also echo um, what. Uh, um, um, uh, <laughs> I just, uh, Wiley just said, um, we, I, I guess we need to really be respectful and address our questions to you, to you, Madam Mayor, because I, I, I feel this divisiveness and there's been so much said on this common council that I, I just want to us 20 alders to actually come to a place where we're actually doing the job of the city, which is trying to really advocate for our constituents. For us to say things like um, the race card, I mean, I think to myself, I think it's ordained that we have the most uh, uh, diverse uh, common council, that it was not by just by luck that we're here. I think that given the disparities in the city that we have, I think we're here for a reason, to do the job, to make sure that the voices of this city is heard. So for anybody not to, for even the people to say, well, I don't know why um, people are saying what they're saying because I haven't experienced that, that racism when I'm when, when getting pulled over. I tell you, we as, as African-American people, I wanna say this and be stern when I say this, we have a curse and we have a blessing. The curse is a, because of the color of our skin, what we go through. But the blessing is the resilience that we're going to stand strong. We're going to come and bring it and try to come up and help everybody. So we need to stop this divisiveness and basically try to come together to do the work of the city. So I wanted to apologize again. I should have said point of order, but that was just stirring in my soul and I had to say something there. So I'm sorry. Thank you, Alder Miyadze. And um, it, might be useful and uh, absent a council chief of staff, I'll maybe ask attorney Haas to dredge up the cheat sheet for Robert's rules and uh, send that around to the council again. Um, so folks can have that at their fingertips and, and you won't need to search for the words because you'll be able to look them up. Uh, President Abbas. Thank you. Let me make one thing really clear. Uh, this whole community is watching this, also this common council. I'm not only a brown man, I'm a Muslim immigrant brown man. Again, I'm a Muslim migrate to America, Muslim immigrant brown man. My experience, if I feel discriminated, or I feel this council is discriminating, if I'm sharing this experience, that does not mean I'm using race card. Let me make another thing very clear. Your race play a critical role in your life and journey. Either it's positively, either negatively. It depends where you come from, how much privilege you have. It play a very important role. I know my journey where I come from. And it is di extremely disappointing when there's a conflict with the white folks, I am being told by some fellow of this member, it's my responsibility to find the solution, putting all the guilt again on minority communities. This is shameful. 
using race card is absolutely this phrase I heard all too often and it ignite a certain anger and frustration. It's happening again and again. I just don't want to discuss more on personal issues, but I do feel this council need to consider, or perhaps we as a council like president, I should organize a meeting on microaggression and what exactly the race is and how people of color feel when they get pushed to the corner. Thanks. Thank you, President Abbas. Alder Carter. Well, if I didn't know better, I would think I was in Tupelo, Mississippi, instead of Madison, Wisconsin. I just want to, um, I won't be moving my, uh, my motion uh, because I'm just at a loss for words right now. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Bennett. If I can get my computer to work today, um, I just want to say I, I like I am I don't know. This debate is um, heart wrenching. I think for everyone, um, and I want to say that all of you are very validated in how you feel. All of us in general are validated about how we feel about race and how that plays a role in our decisions because it does it plays a role in like every decision that we make so i i, I just want to validate that that when you feel that way i get it <laughs> um we're entitled to feel that way um and i also want to say that um coming out of this I hope that we can go through some healing because every time we've had this debate, it's been really, con I, it's not even controversial. It's just ooh, attacking uh, and on either end of the table. Um, like maybe attacking isn't the right word to say. I'm sorry. I'm, words are hard right now, but I want to say that I am very open to um, learning um, and I feel as though on my end, I have felt a bit, I've been questioning like why these are coming up when, when people in, in open session or behind or, um, on, in private have stated that like, um, new people like myself are only making these types of votes because other people or other white people are telling us how to vote or that they're using our color um, as a means to get these votes across. I feel like insulted on my own intelligence when that's stated um, as if I'm not a free thinker um, and can make up my mind on these votes. Um, I felt as though when I've made this vote in particular, I haven't done so um, because of some racially biased thinking. However, I'm really open to understanding more why there's those feelings. Um, and if you feel as though myself or anyone else on council is being racist or Islamophobic, or in, against immigrants, we can have that discussion. Um, and I just, I think that like out, out, out of this, we shouldn't come out of this discussion or out of, out, out of council with these hard feelings because that's going to affect how we operate in the future and that we do need to um, come to terms with why we're feeling this way um, and have some healing um, in this process. So that's where I'm at in this. Um, I kind of just want to take the vote and talk later. 
about healing. Thank you, Alder. Alder Figueroa Cole. Thank you, Mayor. I, I have one short comment and a question for you. So I, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, what I said is what I said, and it's coming out of pure frustration, and mainly for from the com, from the context that Alder Bennett just explained. To have people on this committee call me and and again, you know, to tell me directly that a white male is controlling my vote. So it's just like. Like it puts my, it's insulting to me and, and it's frustrating to, to the level that I cannot, that I cannot express um, because we are all adults and we should be able to have these discussions. We should be able to communicate with each other and get this, this information out there. We shouldn't be having to have these discussions here in public. You should be able to pick up the phone and have the, if you felt offended by something, someone or something that someone said, pick up the phone and have the discussion. That's all I'm trying to get at. But then for you, Mayor, I have a question which I know I asked before because this keeps on coming up. This discussion about process. I mean, is there an actual ordinance or, or um, process that actually states that we have to go and talk to the lead of the committee to make a change to the committee and then go to the TFAX committee to have the TFAX committee make a decision and then bring it to council? Or can any of us at any point in time make a change and bring it forward without getting validation from anybody? I mean, what is, what is, what is the process? I, I'm trying, I, I still don't understand that. Thank you, Alder. Um, you are correct that any Alder at any point in time can introduce a resolution or uh, propose an amendment to the ordinances and uh, there's no requirement to consult with anyone except uh, that if you're proposing an ordinance change you must consult with the city attorney and have them draft that um, if you're proposing a resolution it's highly recommended that you consult with the city attorney's office to make sure that you have it in the proper form um, but other than that, I, I and the city attorney can can contradict me if if he wishes, but I, I don't believe there's any requirement. Um, any alder can propose a, a resolution or an ordinance amendment. Um, I, obviously, there's some requirements around those being introduced at one council meeting, um, any referrals, and then coming back at the next council meeting unless there's a, a vote to supersede that. But um, that's... That's the problem. I mean, that's the the technical legal process. I, I will say that um, there's a perhaps less technical legal process that, uh, in general, the council has followed in the past, which does involve conversations with impacted staff and agencies. Um, often does involve conversations with impacted committees. Um, and it, you know, there's there's been uh, numerous items where before a formal proposal, formal resolution, or ordinance amendment is introduced, that it's discussed at length uh, by either the impacted committees or the council itself uh, before something would come forward for a formal vote. So I, I mean, I think technically, legally, there is a, a fairly short. Um, process that's required um, informally. Uh, and I think, again, this is something that a chief of staff would would support. Um, there is a, a more extended process that people have come to expect. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I mean, because it's, it's um, it, that discussion keeps on coming up and it's extremely confusing to talk about rules when the rules don't really exist. And um, and then lastly, um, on regard to this claim of the emails, I mean, we have public record laws. You can, you can request it or I can simply send the email to everybody and you can see where my take was. So it's clear where, where my frustration is coming up. I will do that after the meeting. So you can all have a copy of the emails that I sent on this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder Curry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I... 
am embarrassed that I had to raise my hand to speak to this, but I don't know if I would have been able, if I will be able to sleep tonight if I don't um, make note of all of the time and energy that has been put into what I think could be personal conversations or the time and resources being used in a more productive solution focused way, such as restorative justice, restorative conversations um, in a non-public manner. I am embarrassed as a public elected official that we have wasted each other's time, staff time, um, the public's time, and folks who are still tuning in with us. I, I can't imagine how this looks, and I would like to implore us, especially using my identity as a Black woman and part of a BIPOC population, but I am Black. But I understand that there are many diversifications and many identities that fit into that. And so because it seems that there is a lot to be said, there are a lot of tensions, there are a lot of personal feelings connected to this topic in particular, I would implore, I don't know, um, Madam Mayor, please correct me if I say anything legally off, but caucusing, we all understand the importance of the diversification of identities, of voices, of cultures, of religions, of it all. We can learn from each other and we can spend so much more time in a more intimate and healing way than we are showing up tonight. And I'm sorry that I have to say that, but I'm also grossly disgusted at the erroneously wrong way race, religion, and difference is being centered in this conversation. Um, I hate to resort to this, but some of you may have uh, seen a, a film called Bamboozled. I feel like we're in a menstrual stroll and we just need to stop this because we're getting further and further from policy. And this is personal and it's embarrassing. And as someone who's a young professional who's aspiring to look to the past to inform my future, not to make the same mistakes, but to grow better, I'm embarrassed because this is not mentorship or what I would like to state claim as a, a body of this um, member, a member of this body, um, as well as someone who's striving towards making change. Madison cannot claim that it wants change but be unwilling to change. So please, let's stop this. We have one more agenda item to get through. There are other ways that we can handle this means of communication. We are at work. Let's be professional and end it. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Um, I do just, you, you left me a small opening there, and so I'll, I'll take it just to remind you all, while I fully support um, the the feeling of uh, conversations amongst the council and um, some resolution that it is not happening on the council floor. We do need to be careful of creating quorums or negative quorums. Um, and so again, here is a place where a council chief of staff might be able to help facilitate the appropriate conversations. Um, failing that, perhaps you're your council staff could step in and, and help with that. Um, but I would just encourage you all to be very mindful of um, the creation of quorum. Alder Curry. I'm sorry, there was one more point that I wanted to bring up in terms of being respectful, and that is acknowledging that we have a BIPOC member in leadership on our Common Council Executive Committee, and that is Vice President Martin and to be respectful that she is here with us. She has not shared her comments, but that should also speak volumes to us. Thank you, Alder. All right, I have no other Alders in the queue. The motion before us uh, is to adopt the ordinance amendments um, with the addition of an effective date of April 19th, 2022. All those in favor of adopting the ordinance amendments, aye. Those opposed, no. Uh, as the clerk, as your name is called, and the clerk will please call the roll. Alder Halverson? No. No? Alder Harrington McKinney? No. No? Alder Heck? Aye. Aye. Alder Limmer? Aye. Aye. Vice President Martin? 
Aye. Aye. Alder Mayazzi? No. No. Alder Rivera? No. No. Alder Vitavir? Aye. Aye. Alder Wahelier? No. No. President Abbas? No. No. Alder Aboris is absent. Alder Benford? No. No. Alder Bennett? Aye. Aye. Alder Carter? No. No. Alder Conklin? Aye. Aye. Alder Curry? Yes. Aye. Alder Evers? Aye. Aye. Alder Figueroa Cole? Aye. Aye. Alder Foster? Aye. Aye. Alder Furman? Aye. Aye. Madam Mayor, I have 11 ayes and eight noes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. With 11 ayes, the motion passes and we'll move on to item 74. Um, just a reminder that item 74 is on for introduction only. So the question is uh, additional referrals. Alder Furman? Uh, Mayor, point of order, I'm gonna withdraw my name as sponsorship on this item. Thank you, Alder Furman. So Alder Furman uh, withdraws his sponsorship of item 74, um, which, uh, I'm sorry, it's after midnight. I'm not sure of the right language. Uh, it, it can't uh, move forward without a sponsor. Um, so it makes the question moot um, unless somebody, don't do this, wants to add themselves as a sponsor. <laughs> Seeing nobody who wants to have themselves as a sponsor, uh, the item is withdrawn uh, and uh, we do not have to discuss additional referrals to the item. Um, and that, thankfully, is the last item that was excluded from the consent agenda. Alder Halverson, it is Madam your Mayor. turn. Madam Mayor, move to adjourn. Is there a second? Yeah. It is seconded by uh, Alder Curry. Uh, is there any uh, objection to recording a unanimous vote in favor of adjournment? Seeing no objection, we are adjourned. Thank you all. I, I hesitate to say it, but Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>